and is to find its aim in it and be without magnitude, without life, without thought. But you not even call it existence. It is something above existence and above goodness. And at the same time, an operative force without any subtraction. As operative force is to communally be getting something else without being itself changed or moved or diminished. The first principle is perfect self sufficiency. Similarity we find in a verse of Ish and Brahada Randya Kupanishad that Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamaduchyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameda Vashishyate which means that Brahma is infinite and this universe is infinite. The infinite proceeds from the infinite then taking the infinitude of the infinite means universe it remains as the infinite of Brahma alone. If we see the translation of it by Madhvananda, quote, I quote, from infinite of fullness, we can get only fullness or infinite, unquote. The above verse describes the nature of the absolute of Brahma, which is definite or full. For example, it contains everything. Upanishadic metaphysics is further elucidated in the Madhu Vidya, honey doctrine, where the essence of every object is described to be same to the essence of every other object. The brother and the Upanishad looks at reality as being indescribable and its nature to be infinite and consciousness bliss. The cosmic energy is thought to integrate in the microcosm and it is microcosm integrated the individual to the universe. Plotinus, the founder of Neoplatonism, explained the universe uh, in a manner complex, abstruse and logical, through comprehensively only to an educated minority of Greeks. His system has certain affinities with that of Indian religions, and Plotinus himself made a serious effort to visit India to learn from the Brahmins. Thus, the possibility exists that Neoplatonism owes something to Indian influence. That is, you can say my hypothesis about this paper. Uh, which I will show you later. Plotinus himself spent much of his time at Alexandria, where he was presumably in contact with the important intellectual currents of his time. Originally from Lycopolis, on the line, he was probably a Hellenized Egyptian, which suggests that his philosophy may bear some traces of native Egyptian thought pattern. As a young man, he went to Alexandria to study philosophy, but was dissatisfied with all his teachers there until he discovered Ammonio Sakas, whose student he remains for 11 years. Various attempts have been made to interpret the designation of Sakas is most probably variant of Shakya. We all know that Buddha has been known as the Shakya cult. The name of Buddha's tribe in India or might mean Indian monk in general. To suggest that Ammonius was either Indian or a Greek of Buddhism seemed presumptuous. Yet linguistic arguments indicate that Shakas is most likely to mean Shakya than anything else. We know there were Buddhists at Alexandria during his lifetime, so it is not impossible. According to Porphyrios, Plotinus, as a mature thinker, propounded the system he had learned from Ammonius. Thus, we do not even know to what extent Plotinus was original. Unquestionably, he demonstrated more than just a passing interest in Indian wisdom wished to seek knowledge at first hand from the Magi of Persia and the Brahmins of India, he attached himself to the army, which the Roman Emperor Gordianus III was about to march into Asia. Nonetheless, in embarking upon so dangerous an adventure at the, uh, at the mature age of 39, Plotinus must have had some definite notion of country of Indian or Persian philosophy. Presumably, he had acquired this at Alexandria, the most cosmopolitan city, of the age. Perhaps too, he was influenced by the prevalent Hellenistic view that a divine revelation had first appeared in the East, or that Brahmins, Medi, Egyptian, or Hebrews had furnished the sources for Greek philosophy. For an Alexandrian thinker of third century to attempt to visit India may establish him as a product of his time. Plotinus philosophy ideas, philosophical ideas are recorded in 54 treaties now arranged into six sets of nine or annuals. All were written in his late middle age. When he was 50, Plotinus went to Rome, 
where he had philosophical lectures open to the public and the annuates are apparently their result. They are the main source of his philosophy from where we gather all the knowledge about Plotinus. They are not systematic exposition of doctrine. Each one already presupposes knowledge of the entire system. The central concept of Plotinus philosophy are number one, the infinity of the knowable world, and number two, the unity of the human soul with the essential underlying nature of the universe. Both are exceptional in the Greek philosophy. The Greeks viewed the cosmos as a limited and defined structure. Thus, the sphere was considered the perfect form. However, certain notions suggestive of Plotinus' idea about the soul do occur in the thought of some of his predecessors. Now we find similarity. Here we can find the similarity about the unity of human soul with the ascension. We find it in Brother and Epiphanesha with chapter 1 and Shloka 9. It says that, I quote, the Brahman 4 in the first chapter announces the Upanishadic non-dual monastic, monistic metaphysical promise that Atma and Brahma are identical oneness. With the assertion that because the universe come out of nothingness, when the only principle exists was I can, I am he. The universe after it come into existence continues as Aham Brahmasmi means I am Brahma. In the last Brahman of the first chapter, the operation explains that the Atma or soul inspires by being self-evident through empowering forms and through actions in the living being. The soul state Sadaranyaka is the imperishable one that is invisible and concealed pervading all reality. I am good. The Brahnaraka Upanishad is one of the principal Upanishad and one of the oldest Upanishadic scriptures, a key scripture to various schools of Hinduism. The Vradharana Upanishad is 10th in the Muktika or canon of 108 Upanishads. The Vradharana Upanishad is a treatise of Atma, means soul, self, includes phases of metaphysics, ethics, and yearning for knowledge that influenced various Indian religions, ancient and medieval scholars and attracted secondary works such as those of Madhva Charya and Adi Shankara Charya. We all know that Adi Shankara Charya has written uh, lots of commentaries on the Upanishadic philosophy. However, Plotinus philosophy belongs to the dominant Greek tradition, both in its rationalistic order of principles and in the importance it attaches to intelligence, means nous, as the spiritual principle pervading the universe. For Plotinus, the world is a fixed intellectual order a hierarchy extending downward from the supreme being, the one through the intelligence, the world soul, and finally, the world of the senses. As such, it connects the lowest form of physical life with the highest form of spirituality. Souls are the organizing forces in physical bodies and also their, gov their, their governors. Thus, every natural force is a soul. He considers individual soul as part of world soul, but not in the same sense in which Physical particles continue separate portions of a large corporal bone. Plotinus' world soul is pure. Its power arises from its ability to contemplate and penetrate the higher orders of being. Firstly, the intelligence, and finally, the one. Sometimes in our uh, Indian philosophy, we call one as the Param Brahma. Like Brahma is the uh, last entity and Param Brahma is unknowable, have no identity, have no shape, no form. And every soul has finally has to reach the Param Brahma. Uh, we call Moksha, if you have heard the, uh, this first. It is difficult to understand the relation of soul to bodies that in the system of Plotinus, his master Plato thought two different theories on this subject. Plotinus is similarly contradictory. On the one hand, he supposes that soul leap downward into bodies through their audacity and desire for independence, attracted by their own images. Association with the body produces the soul impurity and vices. On the other hand, he regards the production of living bodies as a natural function of the soul owing to her desire to be fruitful, to adorn what is below her and to develop her. <clears throat> Association of body and soul is therefore good and necessary. 
Some commentators have suggested that both the views of Plotinus were close to reality. As a religious thinker, he was conscious of the soul's need to abstract itself from the material attachments in order to attain moral purity and ultimately to experience the mystic union with God. But as a metaphysician, he regarded the existent structure of the universe as valid and necessary. Now we discuss about the one. Directly above the world soul is Plotinus, a scheme of things in the intelligence, including all things in the universe as well as the fixed eternal relation among them. The intelligence is the cosmic order, the essence of everything, the totality of all cosmic realities and the collectivity of platonic ideas. It is both one and many. Moreover, intelligence is a spiritual as well as a rational principle. Through contemplation, the soul may attain a mystic vision of various portions of the cosmic system. Seen in their essential nature, in this way, the individual soul can make intelligence prevail in itself, thereby it ascends to the supreme intelligence, which is its own higher principle. Beyond the intelligence is, lies the one. This is the same Param Brahma and one are equal. The ultimate source of all beings and the principle of cosmic unity. All things proceed from the one which overflows to produce multiplicity, but whereas the supreme intelligence is unified by the system and order which binds individual intelligence, the one is in no way multiple. It is equivalent of Plato's supreme idea, the idea of the good. Only by direct intuition can it be known, not through any intellectual or rational process. The soul ascends the one by the way of intelligence, having prepared itself by a virtuous life and acts of purification. As it rises, it loses the characteristics which formerly bound it to the body. All normal consciousness disappears because consciousness demands multiple objects. In this culminating mystic experience, an immovable calmness runs. There is neither knower or known. The soul is alone with God. He felt that priests and temples, ceremonies and prayers were all superfluous. The soul could ascend by its own effort. It is very important to understand that it's showing that no church, no priest or anybody can help you in liberate uh, to the body, but only you or your soul will make efforts for it and the mystic vision would arrive as a consciousness. Plotinus undermines with his distinct vision of the one, a principle that had apparently been fundamental to Greek thought that the limited and finite is the perfect, while the unlimited and infinite is imperfect. In contrast, Plotinus claims infinity, unlimitedness and formlessness to be the one's nature and then calls the ultimate good ground. Plotinus here unveils a new awareness in best thinking, that of a positive infinity, no longer viewing determinateness as an imperfection. And because of this absolute transcendence of one, the most appropriate analysis of the one is a negative analysis. It is Plotinus's refusal to give ultimate status to form, individuality and intelligence that radically sets him apart from the Greek tradition in which he operated. For the purpose of transition, let us again locate Plotinus's attitude towards intelligence. There seem to be two aspects of intelligence. First, there is the articulated system of definite notion, the intangible order, the fixed model of the sensible order. This is the Greek and general, the Western emphasis. Secondly, we find thought directed towards itself, where subject object distinctions disappear. And where finally, intelligence is transcendent and the self is merged with the universal principle. This seems foreign to Greek and most of us in thought. The first considered rational knowledge of the universe, the second considered the mystical union of the beings in the one. The relation of the individual to the universal had always been a Greek problem, but Plotinus moved to show that the universal is present in its entirely in all things without losing its universality. He no longer sought rational knowledge of the universal, but a mystical union where individual consciousness disappears. This is a withdrawal from particular forms and all ethical and intellectual aspects of soul, where the self is lost in contemplation and it is generally this contemplation as the ultimate reality that most consecutively, consecutively connects Plotinus with the thought of India. The Upanishads are fundamental to the philosophy of India. 
Each different form of Indian thought has always had to reconcile itself with them. With the coming of the Upanishads, where they came, rise, uh, rise were replaced by the search for the one reality behind all flux. This was also a movement from the object to the subjective. The key to the one is found within the depth of the human self. The Upanishad then often criticizes ritualistic religion. Liberation is an eternal, non-external experience. The goals of uh, the liberated self is not the bliss of heaven or rebirth in a better world, but freedom from objective, current and union with the absolute, which is not in any state. Absolute being is not an existing quality or object of thought. It transcends all attempts to grasp it as it is the source of all manifestation. It can only be described negatively as the formless, nameless, etc. In relation to concrete beings, it is non-being, but in itself it is fullness of being. In the Maitre Upanishad, we find that Brahma has two aspects, the formless and the form. Through Brahma can take form in the world. The formless is the fundamental reality, the cause of the form effect and the brother and Kupnishad, we hear the statement in uh, fourth chapter, fifth Brahma, 15th Shloka, that Brahma is Neti Neti, not this, not that. You have must heard the word Neti Neti, which is a very important verse from the Upanishad. Here I uh, would like to share with you the dialogue of uh, Yakya Valkya uh, with that of Gargi. So in this dialogue, we'll try to find out what has been similar in Plotinus. It was the court of King Janaka. Yagyavanka received questions from all learned sages and seers assembled there. And he kept offering answers to all of them. Among them was a female sage Gargi, the daughter of Vachaknu. Addressing the assembly, she said, I quote, Reverend Brahmins, I shall ask Yagyavanka two questions. If he is able to answer them, no one among you can ever defeat him. He will be the great expounder of the truth of Brahma. I unquote. Yagyavalka said, ask Ugaki. Gagi said, I quote, Yagyavalka, that which they say is above heaven and below the earth, which is between heaven and earth as well, and which was and shall be. Tell me, in what is it Woven, wrapped, and woven. Yagyavalka said, I quote, that of which they say, O Gargi, that it is above heaven and below the earth, which is between heaven and earth as well, and which was, is, and shall be, that is woven, wrapped, and woven, is either aksha. It is subtle element, so subtle that it is often indistinguishable from consciousness. Without it, nothing can exist, yet there is more. Unquote. Gargi said, quote, Thou has answered my first question, I bodhati. the tea. Oh, Yagyavalkya, be ready now to answer my second question, I unquote. Yagyavalkya said, ask O Gargi. Gargi said, in whom is that either woven, wrap, and woof? Yagyavalkya replied, the sea. O Gargi, call him Akshara, the immutable and imperishable reality. He is neither gross nor fine, neither short nor long, neither hot nor cold, neither light nor dark, neither of the nature of air nor of the nature of either. He is without relation. He is without taste or smell, without eyes, ears, speech, mind, vigor, breath, mouth. He is without measure. He is without inside or outside. He enjoys nothing. Nothing enjoys him. I am good. I could at the command of that reality, Yogagi, the sun and moon hold their course. Heaven and earth keep their positions. Moments, hours, days and nights, fortnights and months, seasons and years, all follow their path. Rivers issuing from the snowy mountains flow on, some eastward, some westward, other in the other directions. He, Ogadi, who in this world, without knowing this reality, offense, oblation, performs sacrifices, practices, austerities, even though for many thousand years, gains little his offerings and practices are perishable. He, Ogadi, who departs this life without knowing the imperishable is pitiable, but he, Ogadi, who departs this life, knowing this, is wise. This reality, O Gargi, is unseen, but is a seed. Is unheard, but is the hearer. Is unthinkable, but is the thinker. Is unknown, but is the knower. 
There is no seen but he. There is no hearer but he. There is no thinker but he. Is no knower but he. In Akshara, verily, O Gargi, the either is woven, rep and woo. Hearing these words from Yagivalka, Gargi again looked at the separate Brahmins <clears throat> and separate Brahmins. Well, may you feel blessed of you get off going before him and no one will defeat Yagavalka expounder of the truth of the Brahma. So in this words, I try to explain the similarity of Brahma. <clears throat> We have been able to see deep similarities of thought between plot and submission. We find the soul initially wrapped in a fallen awareness, attending the multiplicity of, and change as well, the only reality. The task of soul is to purify and deepen its awareness to reveal the absolute formless source behind these manifestations. And this awareness is not external but internal. Found at the depths of the soul, the soul is the absolute at its depth, hence its individuality is transcendent individually as an ultimate principle of transcendence. The world is an emanation of uh, a formless ground. Form is not the ultimate reality. It must unlimitedly deny itself, transcendent itself and return to its ground. This is the process of reality that the emanation and returns reflects in the thoughts of Trotinos and the Upanishads is a noticeably similar for whole organization. Thank you very much. For spending time for me, and I'm grateful to be here. Thanks to the Hellenistic Institute of uh, Budget and post Budget Studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Goswami. And we can pass to the next uh, speaker, who is Professor Vinay Kumar. Uh, I'm welcome here to the podium, who's a uh, professor at the Department of Ancient History, Culture, and Archaeology at Banaras Hindu University, Banaras in India. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning to one and all present here. So I'm going to present my paper on Hellenistic influence on modern art and architecture with a special reference to one of the important motive that is the honeysuckle motive. But before I present my paper, I would like to express my gratitude and wholeheartedly thankfulness to the Hellenic yes. Institute of Byzantine and post Byzantine Institute for the studies as well as Jawala Nehru University New Delhi for giving me an opportunity to express my ideas regarding this particular motive which has been taken from this particular land to the land of India and more particularly in Mauryan art and architecture. So when we talk about the Mauryan art and architecture, so please have a look about an overview of this particular art and architecture. So this Mauryan art and architecture, we know it developed during fourth to second century BC in India during the reign of the one of the important ruler, whose name was Pridarshi Ashok or King Ashok. And this particular, art, it represents an important transition in Indian art from use of the wood to the stone. And there are various examples of this one. And when we analyze this modern art, it exhibits three main phases. And the first phase was the continuation of the already prevalent art in the modern tradition, which is found in some instances to the representation of the Vedic deities. Then we have, and we have so many examples. And second phase was the court art of Ashoka. And typically it was found in the monolithic stones, columns on which these edicts are inscribed. And third phase was the beginning of the brick as well as the stone architecture. And we have the famous example of the water till monument of Sachi. And these all have been uh, views have been given by one of the important art historian, Anand Kumar Swami. And you can see, you can see these all are the specimens. Next one, please. So you can see these are the example are the areas where we can find these things. And when we talk about the modern pillars, 
they are the freestanding columns and they were used, not used as a support to any structure in Indian modern art. And it had two main parts, the sap as well as the capital. And when we talk about the modern stupas, and it is said that King Ashoka, he has constructed 84,000 of stupas after the demise of Lord Buddha. And the solid domes, and these stupas are the solid domes of the brick or the stones, and they are constructed to celebrate the achievement of the God Buddha. So when we talk about the interaction, so we have to first see the contact between these two lands, India as well as the Greece or the West Asia. So this must have been occurred during the 6th century BC, when the Cyrus the Great of the Persia, he enlarged his kingdom to include the Greek cities of Asia Manor in the West and Afghanistan and the cities of and the borderland of India in the East. And after him, his successor, Darius, he tried to extend the conquest even further eastward by annexing Eastern Punjab and Sindh in 578 BCE. And the Persian Empire in these two, in this phenomena, it served as a common meeting point for the Indians as well as the Greeks. And we find so many examples. So among the first Greek who entered to the land of India was the famous Alexander the Great, who descended on the flat plains of Punjab in 326 BC. And his brief expedition of this particular king led to some interesting consequence in every sphere. And one of the sphere was art and architecture. And on Indian side, so I, Alexander's campaign resulted in numerous Greek settlements as well as cities. He founded several and it served as an urban center among the Indian villages. And these cities with their planned layout and the streets as well as the buildings were modeled on the Greek prototype that we know. So we can notice so many Indianization of these Greek elements in the realm of Indian art. For example, in Gandhar, Mathura and Sarnath School of Art, in Terracotta Art, art so I'm not going to tell all in detail. I will be talking about the, only about the influence of this particular motive of honeysuckle motive. So this process of transformation to the extent of Indianization is well reflected in various other spheres. So when we analyze Mauryan art during the time of the Ashoka, we find that the vision of King Ashok was very clear from the very beginning. And it seems that it was preconceived and pre-thought of. So King Ashoka adopted the, all the motives from the Hellenistic world, whether when it suited the Indian ethos as well as the culture. And these all were transformed and taken into the fabric of the Indian art and culture. But it was not a slavish copy or the influence, but it was incorporation to the conscious effort in the historical situation of the close interaction of cultures of the West Asia, Hellenistic world and Indian origin to adopt all those who did the necessary pass. So we can see there are many mo art motives in modern art, which has taken to be the evidence of the foreign influence on Indian art. But amongst these, the most enigmatic is the pomade or the honeysuckle motive, since it has been traced to West Asia, sometimes to Greek, sometimes to the Persian, and other times to the Greek the Persian sources. So the famous art historian George, John Broadman is of the view that the flame leaf pomade or the enthymion on the modern pillars was a Greek invention, which was based ultimately on the old Mesopotamian motif of the straight leaves or the fan pomade. So this motif has been exploited in such, in such a rich manner in Indian art as compared to the West Asia as well as the Greek world, that it has been source of inspiration of the various forms of the Indian art motifs such as the Trishul, Triratn as well as the Srivats. And this pomade, it is also called as Enthymion because of this particular flower, which is in your land, in the Greek land. So it is an ornament of the honeysuckle of the fence shaped leaves of the palm tree in the radiating cluster. And we know that you are better know about all these things more than me. So it has been largely employed into the Greek or the Roman era to decorate the fonts of the antifexy the making of the ionic columns, as well as the cementium of the cornice. So you can. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Yes. Can I ask you this? Yeah, yeah. Go, go on. Yeah. It would be better if you can be. 
So when the acanthus leaf was added at the base of the lotus as well as the comet elements, it produced the designs usually known as the anthemion or the honeysuckle. Though generally known as the honeysuckle motif from its resemblance to the flower, its origin is found in the flower of the acanthus plant. So this honeysuckle, the botanical name is the Lonicera caprifolium. They, these are the arcing serps or the twining points in the family Capricoriaceae, native to the northern hemisphere. And there are more than 180 species of this particular flower. And over 100 species, they occur very commonly in Europe as well as the North America, have only 20 native uh, this species of this particular flower. And it is widely known by the other species that is Lonicera periglomerium, that is a European honeysuckle, and with Lonicera japonica, Japanese honeysuckle or the Chinese honeysuckle and the Lonicera semper venus that is the coral honeysuckle. So there are many varieties of this one. So you can see here, this is that particular Lonicera caprifolium about which I am going to talk about. So when we talk about this origin of this particular honeysuckle motif, from where it was it originated. So the famous uh, this art historian, John Irwin, who has worked a lot on the modern art and architecture. So he's of the view that it has been traced to the origin to the Egypt and its journey from Asia Minor, Greece, India, and Greece, India, Iran, then to India. So the ultimate source of this so-called honeysuckle motif was lotus, which are crystallized in the Egyptian art, and the basal drums of the persepolitan pillars are very near to the Egyptian blue lotus, lotus as is depicted in the Egyptian art. You can see the examples here. Yeah, you can, you can see it very clearly here. And according to him, the India borrowed this honeysuckle motif directly from the West Asia, quite independent of the Greece and also Persia, and he used them in a manner neither the Greeks nor the Persian had done that right. To the Greeks as well as the Persian, it was a decorative element, and to the Indian, it was a symbol of fecundity or the symbol of purity. So you can see this one. This is the conventional form of the Egyptian lotus. And in a well-known example of this Assyrian variation that Egyptian lily gave birth to the bird and thus produced the knob and the flower motif when he entered to the Indian land. And you can see this one, this is the line drawing. So it was from the Asia manner that the Greeks in the sixth century BC derived their own anthemian already, which was evident or present at Delphi. And it reached the mature form onto the Erechtheum at Athens in the fifth century BC. So you can see this is the example of the molding in treasury at the Delphi, Greece, showing the knob and the flower that is the pomade motif of the late 6th century BC. And also you can see the ornament from this ionic treasure from late 6th century BC, which is now housed in the Delphi Museum. So another example you can see, this is the early Greek anthemia with the struggle below. And this is from the, again, from the Delphi. And this, uh, in another example, we have the moldings in the treasury at the Delphi in Greece. So James Ferguson, in 1876, he suggested that the motif honeysuckle, which was found on the modern pillars, might have originated in West Asia, particularly in the Assyria. So this is another view now regarding, to, uh, regarding the origin of this particular motif. And he is of the opinion that the Allahabad pillar motif of the modern period is a lateral copy of the honeysuckle ornament, which we are familiar with, the, which was exactly used by the Greeks with the ionic order. Regarding the honeysuckle ornament to the Allahabad column, he is of the view that it is almost a literal copy of the honeysuckle ornament. We are so familiar with it, used by the Greeks with the ionic order. In this example, it is hardly probable that it was introduced directly by the Greeks in India. But it is more likely to have been to the Persia from Syria when the Greek also had originally obtained this one. So this is that example which I am talking about, this honeysuckle motif on the abacus of the Allahabad pillar capital. Now, so you can see this is the close-up of this abacus of the Allahabad pillar capital. With the, along with this, we have the bead and reel motif. And I was very fortunate to see this museum with these kind of examples here. So attention may also be drawn to the capital discovered by discovered at the famous site of Patliput, which is now the Patna in Bihar. And it was ex excavated by Vadal, W.A. Vadal, 
and it has the steps imposed blocks or the side volutes and the central formates of the perceived pollution order. And the bead and the reel, as well as the spiral motif on the lateral face, are all of the West Asiatic origin. Although these elements are combined in a manner different form that of the Iranian capital, they suggest not only the prototype, but largely through the profile of the projective volutes also of the Greek ionic order. So, so this is that example which I am talking about. But according to the famous Greek historian or Greek scholar, Professor U.P. Arora, he is of the view that in this capital, Western Asiatic motifs are there, but the very safe as well as, well as the side volutes of this capital clearly betray a distinctive Hellenic inspiration. And even the row of the rosette on the abacus, which the Roland, Benjamin Roland, links with the Persepolis can be traced to the Greek prototype. This is the view of Professor U.P. Arora. And similar rows of the rosette appear as the frames of the Minon, as well as the Mycenaean wall paintings, which are much older to the Persepolis examples. So this is that uh, uh, specimen discovered by Wagel at Patlibut. So you can see this is the example. This is the detail of the painting from the Minon, which is creating Greece. And Hellenistic uh, Bronze Age period, this is the time period of this one. And when we talk about the development or the stages of the transformation of this motif into the modern art, so as regard the exact source of these borrowings, the Indian context, it is argued that same we are not directly taken from the Achaemenians, but from the common source of West Asia to the supposition that even prior to the Achaemenid, Achaemenid influence in the middle of the first millennium BC, Greek, Iran, and India were all peripheral cultures borrowing from the same West Asiatic source from that origin which were constituted by the Assyria, the Levant, as well as the Ionian. And the artists of the Greeks, India, Iran, employed these borrowed motifs in a spirit totally alien to their land. But the application of the term honeysuckle to the plant ornament appearing in the Indian abacus is doubly misleading because Indian version of the flower motif in this fact, neither honeysuckle nor Greek anthemian both are borrowers. The Indian used the same Asiatic or the Greek motif, but they employed it as a flat decoration on the abacus. Both the West Asians as well as the Indians saw the honeysuckle as a symbol of fecundity. However, during the process of assimilation in India, where the lotus was already present into our land, it was natural that the borrowed honeysuckle should have been assimilated to the form of the Indian Padma lotus. So in the process of Indianization or the transformation, the Huns or the geese was another example of the example, uh, the Indianization of the beautiful architectural ornament. And it is perhaps the only element in the Mauryan capital which is wholly Indian. And the connection of the Huns and the lotus with the water is obvious in our culture. And the goose in Indian folk tone is conceived as a feeding on the lotus that we know. So, so these are the examples of the progressive stages of the transformation of this, this honeysuckle motif. And the snake hood like curls that characterize the Ashokan pyramids are nowhere to be found in identical form outside India. So this is an example from your temple of Apollo Dijima. And you can see on the base of this column showing the anthemion as well as the bird pattern closely resembling the knob and the flower motif as well as honeysuckle motif. And also we have our own motif, swastik motif, you can see at the back. And swastik also uh, one of the auspicious symbol in Indian art and culture. And again at Sankisa, about which already Ferguson has narrated. So the abacus of this elephant, this is an elephant capital here at Sankisa. And it is in Parukaba district of Uttar Pradesh. And here the elephant crown Sankisa column has been carved with the rosette as well as the pomade and their petals resemble with the snake pool and the late Dr. S. P. Gupta. He suggested a name for it. He called this as the Nag Post. So now this one is second has been, become the Nag Post in Indian art. So according to him, the pomade of the pillar is the Indianized form of the Greek motif that is the honeysuckle. And there is one flower of this kind in India, which is quite different from the honeysuckle or the pomade. This is known as Nag Kesha or Kanakthava or Hemikaljalika in Sanskrit and iron ore in India. So this is the iron ore, this uh, Anishakal motif. In Hindi, we call it as Pila Nagatisha, the same motif. And at the Sankisa, it, we find the association of this Anishakal motif 
with the people motive also. So it is not a naturalistic situation. According to the John Irwin, it describes the power or the capacity of the certain elements to combine with the others and to produce a new whole, transcending its part. So here, the honeysuckle by association with the cosmic water or the premier water or the hill, as well as the serpent, was added up to, and it all represents the symbol of fecundity or the symbol of fertility. Next one. Next one. So I'm talking about all these symbols and this one. You can see here, this is the elephant capital from Sankisa. And similar example we can find at the Basti line capital of modern period. You go on. You can see this is a Nag Nag pushed as well as the comment motifs on the Rampurva bull capital, now which is housed in the residence house at uh, Rashtrapati Bhavan in India. So, and similarly, we can notice this uh, uh, at the Bajra, uh, this Bajrasan at the Bodhya, this is the seat over which by sitting Lord Buddha, he got the enlightenment. So here also you can see the association of this Nag piece with the Hans motif here in Indian art and culture. So again here you can see association in the beach with the plural motif of Sachi line capital. And similarly on the Rampurva by this uh, line capital, we can see this one. So coming to the conclusion, so nowhere in West Asia as well as the Greek world, we have the evidence of exploitation of the honeysuckle motif in such a rich manner. It is combined with mother goddess. It is represented with the bees. It is depicted with the people leaf. It decorates the pillar capital. It adorns the crest of the gateway and it is prominent in Pringle stone also in modern art. So in this way, the borrowed honeysuckle or the palmate motif entered into the body fabric of the Indian art. And the problem of the social acceptance was tackle through the local identification of the honeysuckle motif. This is called the process of transformation leading to the extent of Indianization. So in this lies the conscious effort as well as the genius of the Indian artist to adopt all that suited the nascent ethos. Thus we can see a borrowed motif imbued with the touch of difference, which we call the product of Indianization or transformation. Thus, in modern period of Indian art and contribution of the West Asia or the Greek art form was definitely there, but its quantum was limited and its basic features were transformed and Indianized. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kuban, and uh, we'll be taking questions during the discussion at the end of the uh, talks. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Gianluigi Segarelva, who's a doctor of philosophy, University of Vienna, who will be talking about analogy between Plotinus and Indian philosophy. And I think he's online. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have only a question. Um, may I share my PowerPoint or uh, otherwise yes, I can send you my PowerPoint thereafter as you like it. Uh, if I can share, uh, I can. Because here I see that I may not, that is, uh, I think I, I need some permission or some Yes, now, right now, right now. You want to try now? Ah, yes. Screen? Excuse me. Yes, it should function. Thank you very much. Thank Sorry. you. Oh, now I have only to. That's Thank you. I have only to. So, to... Yeah. thank you very much. I thank you very much for the invitation. I hope I am audible. I'm audible, or uh, the voice is not so good. I'm audible. Yes, yes. It's, ah, thank you very much. So I would like to thank you very much for the invitation and for your interest. Uh, of course, the contents of these um, of this PowerPoint are uh, at disposal. I can send to everybody who has interest. I would like now to uh, put some uh, another to, to to underline some analogies which, in my opinion, are present between Plotinus and uh, the, some aspects of the, of course, of the very rich Indian uh, philosophical thought. 
And I would begin with this uh, quotation from the, from the Chand Yoga Upanishad, Tatvamazi, that is, you are that. Because in my opinion, this quotation can give us some elements in order to uh, underline, to outline the analogies which, is, which are between, which are present, in my opinion, at least between Plutinus and the Indian philosophical thought. That is, uh, Tatvamasi uh, open us the space for um, for the question of appearance and reality. That is, in true, we are something, and what are we? We are all the manifestation of one factor, which can be in the in some aspects of the Indian philosophical thought, Brahman or Atman, and in Plotinus is the one. But what does it mean specifically about the uh, concerning the uh, the situation of the individual in the world? It is our situation, our condition in the world. It means that we have we have had uh, some sort of descent from of detachment from the from the common principle from the one principle. And that we should try to ascend uh, to ascend again to this principle. That is through a uh, through um, a thread of purifications and through a thread of knowledge. That is, we should go back to the principle. We are initially in our life not connected to the principle, in spite of the fact that we are linked to the principle. Well, we are not aware that we are connected to the principle. And one of the ways in which we can go back to the principle is the refusal or at least the limitation of the sense dimension. This is a common point to the um, analogies between Plotinus and the philosophy of Plotinus and some aspects of the India, um, Indian thought. Uh, we can see now some principles that will mention only some of them, and then I will pass to the lecture, perhaps to the reading of some passages, both from Protinus and from the Indian, uh, uh, Indian philosophical thought. It said we should go back to the principle, that is, initially in our life, we are not with the principle, we are not united to the principle. The individual each individual is initially in a certain situation should come back to the original situation. This should go over this detachment from the principle. The fatherland of the individual is not the sense dimension. This is an expression of Plotinus. He says, our fatherland is not here, but it's another place. And there it is a, formal, a formula of Plotinus, Afelepanta, Cutting out everything that is you, we could should cut out everything, cut out the uh, connection, the linkage to the sense dimension, and we should retire in ourselves. Every individual soul should retire in ourselves, should concentrate, should concentrate on itself, and should um, limit as far as possible the influence of the perception of the se of the sense of the matter of the average way of life. That is the concentration in oneself is necessary is the first step towards the return, towards the coming back to the principle. The individual should go away from uh, the average way dimension, gain the concentration in oneself, not let himself be distracted by the extern external events and by the external perception. There is a necessity of coming back to a different dimension if the individual, provided the individual want, wants really to know the principle from which the individual derive, derives. The individual should come to a different dimension for that in which he is. And at least for some moments, the individual should go to another dimension than the average life dimension. Um, there is an enlightenment, an instruction thread, an idea from the third line, a revelation or a process of learning about the individual's authentic position. And there is a difference between what the individual is in truth and what the individual thinks to be, what one thinks to be. That is, what one thinks to be is not the authentic dimension of the individual, but the individual needs a thread of learning, of knowledge, or, self, or retirement in oneself in order to discover how reality is, in order to eliminate the appearance in which he is. 
there is a discrepancy between, between what one thinks to be and what one can learn to be. There is a huge discrepancy. And the knowledge of the structure of reality is knowledge of oneself, since this is knowledge of one's way of development in a one's existential and essential ground. Reality is connected. There is Brahman Hatman, which is present very well. Or for Plotinus, there is a soul, which is present in the individual, the common soul. Reality is not made out of separated elements. On the contrary, the outer reality is in one principle, depends on one's principle, and is the manifestation of one's principles. And now I will not uh, speak of all the principles, but of course, there are very many, very many things which could be said about uh, the list of uh, analogies which we can find. But I, I would like to make a spring to uh, some passages of Plotinus about the likeness to God, the necessity that we become godlike, and the thread in which we can become godlike. Plotinus says explicitly that evil exists, evil is here. And we are initially, at least, in the dimension in which also evil is present. That is, we are, uh, so to speak, uh, entities which, has, which have had a decadence. And in order to be free from evil, we have to escape the dimension of perception on the average way of life. Plotinus points out that through the virtues we can become similar to God. And virtues are the way for us of attaining likeness to God. The thread of virtues is the thread to God, to the connection and to the unification with God, with the one. The individual should change how to change his original dimension. And in order to become similar to God, to become similar to God, excuse me, lies in the potentiality of the individual. This Plotinus says, sure about it, we can come back to God if we want to. The individual has this capacity in spite of the fact that he's not aware of it. Now, in order to, uh, to, to quote a, a passage from Plotinus about uh, the virtues, and about the uh, way in which we should uh, orientate our lives. He says, for instance, here in Eneds in in 1, 2, uh, and 3rd third, third Tractatus, to Plato, he says, commenting some passages of Plato, to Plato, unmistakably, there are two distinct orders of virtues. And the civic does not suffice for likeness. Likeness to God, he says, is a flight from these words, ways, and things. This likeness to God is for Plato and Plotinus as a scholar, so, so a metaphorical scholar of Plato because there is a huge difference of time, but he follows the theories of Plato and interprets the theory of Plato. In order to reach the likeness to God, he says, in order to become God-like, Plotinus says we have to fly away from these words, way, and things. And for this, there is a... Um, and determine the specific thread. And uh, about, the, uh, about the question of the virtues, he says, for instance, here, um, wisdom or such a disposition is in the soul become thus intellective and immune to passion. It would not be wrong to call likeness to God. For the divine too is pure and the divine act is such that likeness to it is wisdom. That is, we have to reach wisdom and wisdom consists in the liberation from the passions and the liberation from the attachment to the uh, sense dimension and to the sense dimension of, uh, of the desires and of the average way of life. Now, I would like to make another uh, examples about the... Uh, different theories of bloating, and we can perhaps make, a, of course, the materials are very many because there are very many analogies, but perhaps I could quote this uh, passage, uh, which I mentioned before. Uh, Plotinus Plotin says that about the individual's destination that our fatherland is the God. Our fatherland is the God. And he says here in another of uh, the NLs, he says, but, but what must we do? Or how lies the path? How come to vision the inaccessible beauty dwelling as if in the consecrated presence 
apart from the common ways where all women might see, even the profane, he that has the strength, let him arise and withdraw into himself, foregoing all that is known by the eyes, turning away forever from the material beauty that once made his joy. So to I read only the, 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 the written in red, Thus, so to one that is held by material beauty and will not break free shall be precipitated, not in body, but in soul, down to the dark depths loathed of the intellective being, where blind even the lower world shall have commerce only with shadows there as here. That is, Athenus is clear. There is the possibility that we can be connected to God again, but there is also the possibility of further decadence. We have the responsibility for this passage, for this trade, for this process. Either we choose to be detached from the sense dimension and from the desires of the material things, or and retire in ourselves and concentrate on our soul and uh, through a process of uh, so growing self-retirement, we can go to the uh, God, the one, or we can choose the way of sense perception, of desires, of materiality, of material things. And in this case, our destiny is clear too. We will go to uh, a further, a growing stage of, um, of moral worsening. Now, in order to uh, make perhaps a conclusion with the proposition of Plotin, so that I then can give you some analogies in the Indian culture and thought. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to quote uh, this, uh, this affirmation of Plotin or Plotinus. Plotinus says, we have to go at the distance from everything, that is from everything which is external and retire in ourselves. And he synthesized this uh, program with the uh, affirmation after panta, that is cut everything, cut out everything, uh, go at the distance from everything. And uh, he says here, at the end of the Aeneas 5, 3, 16, 17, he says, and this is true, and had said before the soul to take that light, to see the supreme by the supreme, not by the light of any other principle. To see the supreme, which is the means to the vision. For that which illumines the soul is that which is to see, just as it is by the sun's own light that we see the sun. But how is this to be accomplished? Cut away everything, which is afelepanta, is the translation. That is, we have to abandon as far as possible the connection and the linkage and the links, the ties to the external world and retire now ourselves. This is the first passage. So, and now, in order to give also uh, um, the analogies with which, in my opinion, are, uh, of course, there would be very, very many uh, things to be said about Plutinus because he's a very rich philosopher and because there are actually very many analogies to be discovered with Indian cultural thought, but I would like to limit myself, since the time is not so much, to this uh, quotation. But I would say that we can find Analogies, for instance, as regards as regards the program of detachment of from the perception and from the uh, material world, I would say that the first text which can give us a really very very precious and very interesting elements is the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, and in particular the our uh, book two of the Gita in which the, so to speak, the, the uh, detachment uh, from the sense dimension is pleaded for. That is, throughout the whole book, we can find that the author always says that we have to retire in ourselves, that we have to limit the influence of Thomas and Rajas, which binds us all of us to the dimension of the perception, of the materiality, of the sensuality, of the desires which are connected to the material, and that we have to retire in ourselves and dominate so the 
um, the tendency to uh, remain in the dimension of the pair reception. In the our book two, we can find very, very many elements which are similar to the program of self-retirement, of retirement in oneself, on concentration on one sound soul, which is pleaded for in Plotinus. This is the first element of analogy. And in order, I would say that uh, these two, uh, these um, element two of analogies is to be found in another text, this time in the Upanishad, and precisely in the Katopanishad. In the first book, uh, in the second chapter, in the second, in the first chapter, the second chapter of the Katapanishad. Also, through the uh, famous image of the chariot, we can find that the message is, among other things, that we have to limit the sense dimension, that we have to limit the, the dimension of sensuality in order, and that we have, of course, to privilege the concentration of the intellect in order to go forward in our development, in our spiritual development, and in our coming back to God. These are two first elements of uh, analogies, of strong analogies at least in my opinion. Another element which was already quoted was is that, uh, that uh, concerning the conception of the negative theology, that is Plotinus, says many times, we cannot say what God is. We can only say that it is not this, and it is not this, and it is not this. This We have a kind of a sort of negative theology and a point which is very similar to be, to be found in the Priyadaranyaka Upanishad, uh, namely in 236, uh, when the, it is said that uh, the black man, we can only say neti neti, not these, neither these, neither these. You can say only what Brackman is not. This is another point of analogies. And uh, in order to give further elements, because I see that the time is nearly vanishing, unfortunately, there are so many things to be spoken about. Um, returning, coming back to the Chandyoga Upanishad, which I quoted at the beginning of my very, of my, at the very beginning of my uh, exposition, uh, in the uh, Chandyoga Upanishad 3, uh, 14, 1 up to fear, we can see that uh, um, it is said that the black man is everything. And that is, there is a common principle for the, our reality. And this is common to Plotin, Plotin, which says, Plotinus, which says many times, the, the one is in everything. Also, if we do not know this, if even so, we are not aware of this. Excuse me, I come to the, because there are very many points also in the, Upanishad, but I would like to conclude with the Chandyoga Upanishad, if I find it. Uh, yes. All this is Brahman. You see, yeah, 3, 14, 1. All this is Brahman. Everything comes from Brahman. Everything goes back to Brahman. And the very thing is sustained by Brahman. And this can be found with different words, of course, but the principle is analogically, seen analogically, very similar to what uh, Plotinus says about the one. The one is uh, the root of everything from the one, it comes everything and the one is present in everything. God or, or the one is present in everything. Of course, Plotinus says, uh, uses different elements. And in order to conclude, uh, I would like to conclude with the Chandyoga Upanishad from the very passage from which I had began my exposition in Chandyoga Upanishad say, say, 6, 10, 1, uh, he say, it is said, Osomia, those rivers belonging to the east run to the east, and those belonging to the west run to the west. Rising from the sea, they go back to it and become one with it. Just as when they reach the sea, they do not know their separate identities. I am this river or I am this river. In the same way, Osomya, all these beings having come from Sat, Brahman, never know this. They never think we have come from Sat. Whatever they were before in this world, 
whether a tiger or a lion or a leopard or a bird or a bug or insect or flea or mosquito, they are born again according to their karma. They never know that they came from sat. That is, and here there is really a correspondence because also in uh, Protinus it is said, everyone comes from the one, even if everyone does not know it, does not acknowledge that the common root is the one. Yeah, there is really a correspondence one-to-one -to, -one to the uh, principles of Plotinus. And in order to conclude, and this we have already seen at the beginning, that which is the substance of all is the self of all of these. It is the truth. It is the self that thou art. Sir, please explain it. It is the, it is a quotation which when, which with, with which I had begun. Fantat asi, that is, um, apparently we are different, but in true, we are this. We are the Brahman, we are Atman, we are manifestation of the same principles. And this is also, also something which uh, is uh, valid, which holds for the very principles of Plotinus. Plot uh, apparently we are separated from one, from each other, but actually, in truth, we are all manifestations of the common one of God. And we have to be aware of this and we have to come back to this principle. This, we are detached from the principles. We have to be aware that we are detached by this principle, from this principle, that we are not in the normal condition, that we are called to something else and we have to come back to the principle. I thank you very much. Thank you very much for the attention. Yes, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Sekareva for the very interesting uh, presentation, and I'm sure there'll be questions during the discussion. But right now, I'd like to invite the last speaker, which is Professor Panayotis Bakis of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece, who will be speaking about Osiris Dionysus as cultural heroes of India. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Good morning. My name is Panagiotis Pakis. I'm an emeritus professor in the uh, study of religion at the Aristotle uh, University of the Faculty of Theology. And I will speak as our president of the talk. The theme of my presentation is about Osiris Dionysus as cultural heroes of India. Diodorus Siculus presents his historical library, a panorama of ideas and practices that dominated the Egyptian way of living during his own lifetime, first century BC. The information that Diodorus provides regarding the religious practices of Egypt is of particular importance since it comes to the knowledge about Egypt. At this point, we should focus our attention, apart from these other references to the Egyptian religion, mainly on the narratives about the mythical world of the Egyptian religion. A prevalent position in the descriptions of the Egyptian divine world by the other Cyclus holds the connection of Osiris with Dionysus. The culture given Osiris, according to Diodorus, is the alter ego of Dionysus. It should be mentioned here that, that the identification of those gods by the other Siculus is different compared to the one made by Herodotus, despite the fact that they both depend on the interpretation of Greek. All the above take on particular importance regarding the overall spirit of, of the Hellenistic era when we examine the related narrative to Diodorus since the writer pays particular attention to everything pertaining the dissemination of the civilization by Osiris Dionysus, especially through their expeditions in the whole ecumenic. Among the cultural goods that are offered to people by the above gods, the most important are the learning of how to make new tools that will be useful in people's everyday occupations like agriculture, cultivation of grapevines, candy, etc., the creation of laws and the foundation of new cities. 
The spread of civilization by these specific deities can be connected to relevant theories about the origin of civilization, where emphasis is given to the cultural role of cranes, but also to the direct relation between religion and politics. The correspondence between grains and civilization is sort of dominant in previous periods, especially in Athens during the 5th century BC. This phenomenon is connected to the so-called cultural heroes who spread agriculture by the primary cause of every culture. What is really important among the cultural accomplishments of the cultural heroes is the end of cannibalism, which according to Diodorus, Diodorus sorry, was a use of a phenomenon prior to the spread of agriculture to man. In this manner, takes place the transition from the environment of the wild at out of limits nature to the civilized way of living. In this way, it is made clear that the savage habits of the previous periods, such as scavenging, belongs to the past. At this point, we have a barrier between the thorny, that means uncivilized, and the cultivized, that means civilized way of the people of the people. The next step is the establishment of laws, another basic principle that enhances the way of living, making it more civilized. The eccentric activity of the two deities seems to correspond to analogy the analogous task of the Ptolemies, the beloved hero of Demeter. After all, it should not escape our notice that during the reign of the Ptolemies, the Ptolemies are receiving great honors in Egypt. The rulers of Egypt identify with the Ptolemies, a factor which results to the connection of the latter with the Cyrus, both of whom, according to Diodorus, are connected with the discovery and spread of agriculture in Arabia and India. In this case, the Iodorus goes one step further, identifying the Ptolemies with Osiris without separating the Greek from the Egyptian tradition. These narrations are part of the spirit of the age of the Ptolemies, as it will be mentioned below and implied in Tatis Mutandis, the civilizing activity of Alexander. This approach of Egyptian theologumena by Diodorus Siculus might comprise a further confirmation regarding the encouragement, especially in the case of examining mythical narration, that we should always pay attention to the man behind the curtain. This becomes, that this becomes even more apparent if we take into account the fact that the particular mythical narration could be considered as an ideological activity which is an ongoing process of constructing, of horizing, and reconstructing social identities or social formations. This becomes clear if we take into consideration what Bruce Lincoln, a uh, University of Chicago, so aptly remarks ideology is not just an ideal against which social reality is measured or an end toward the fulfillment of which groups and individuals aspire. And most importantly, it is also a screen that strategically fakes, mystifies, or distorts important aspects of real social processes. At this point, it is especially important to know that the dissemination of an mythical narration in a specific historical period, according to Bruce Lingo, will depend on a great many factors, many of which are contingent to the specific situation. In general, two factors must be taken into account. First, there is the question of whether a disruptive discourse can gain a theory, uh, that is how widely and effectively it can be propagated. This largely depends on the ability of its various channels of communication, formal and informal, established and novel. Second, there is the question of whether the discourse is persuasive or not, which partially a function of its logical and ideological coherence. Although such factors, which are by nature internal to the discourse, have, have their importance, it must be stressed that persuasion does not reside within any discourse per se, but is rather a measure of audience's reaction to and interaction with the discourse. 
Although certain sports may thus be said to have or lack persuasive potential as a result of their specific content, persuasion itself also depends on such factors as rhetoric, performance, timing, and the positioning of a given, a given a discourse vis-a-vis -vis both others with which it is an active or potential competition. Furthermore, Bruce Lincoln maintains that here is the question of whether and the extent to which a discourse succeeds in calling for and following this ultimately depends on whether a discourse elicits those sentiments out of which new social formation operating along rational or pseudo-rational and moral or pseudo-moral lines, but is also an instrument of sentiment evocation. Moreover, it is through these pair instrumentalities, ideological and sediment evocation, that is called holds the capacity to save and resave society itself. Nevertheless, the innovation of the Hellenistic period regarding the beneficial influence of the God on people's lives lies in the transition from the mythical to the historical time. For Lingon mentioned a dialectic direction of past and present is evident in the myths. The above position is further reinforced by the view of Russell McCutcheon, who points out, we should not forget that despite the attempts to construct a past or future long removed from the present, myth-making takes place in a specific socio-political moment and supports a specific judgment about the here and now. All the above acquires special significance if we consider that all human doing is contextualized within historical, that means social, political, economic, etc., pressures and influences. We must therefore understand also do it parcel and relate to specific temporary and culturally located words. This is far further emphasized if we approach them under the spectrum of a panorama of beliefs and practices that are characteristic of the system of the Hellenistic age. All this takes some special significance when we take into account the two intensive Theodorus regarding the above activities of Osiris Dionysus. So, the deeper meaning of this very narration of these divine activities, the better the root, when, when one considers that they constitute a reflection of the broader views of his times according to which the divine monarchs are protectors and constant carriers of civilization in the holy domain. They are the representatives of harmony, order, and stability, in other words, the divine uh, saviors and benefactors. Diodorus' tactic aims to ascribe to the monarchs of the country of the Nile, according to the status quo of this period, the benefactory attributes of these who spread agriculture to the world and thus create more prosperous conditions for the development of civilization. This sexually determines the monarch's political behavior. As new gods, they travel around the community and disseminate cultural goods to all people, who in their turn recognize them as providers of culture and benefactor of humanity. A key factor in understanding them can be, as it has, it has been already been mentioned above, the historical events related to the Hellenistic period. Among them stands out during the, this period the development of special relations of the kingdom of the successors with the several regions, among them with India, of the broader domain. India was always considered to be a par excellence source of wealth, and that is why everyone had aimed already from the beginning of the Hellenistic era to control this region. It should neither escape us that the Greeks, according to the relevant testimonies, had a significant impact on India. The presence of the Greeks in India spans over a long period of about 1,000 years from the 6th century BC, when, as we had already heard before, uh, until the 5th or even 7th century AD. The first Greeks to arrive in India were Ionians from the Greek cities of Asia Minor who served in the court of the Achaemenids in Persia. However, the essential presence of the Greeks begins at the time of Alexander the Great, 
a task that Alexander campaign paved the way and created the necessary conditions for the spread of Hellenism in the Eastern world. When Alexander left India, the conquered lands were in the hands of the Greeks in the first century BC. After the Greeks rulers who play an important role in the region is Menander Soter. The presence of the Greeks in this area is also proven by the number of archaeological finds discovered in the Bactria region, as well as in the cities of Taxila, Saka, and of course, Aichainum. India's communication with the Western world continues throughout the Hellenistic era. The relation between India and the kingdoms of the successors, especially the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, are becoming more and more important during the sales. The, uh, 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 the importance of these areas can be understood, among others, by the constant uh, military confrontation between the two dynasties in order to conquer these territories. At the same time, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies maintain diplomatic and commercial contacts both with the native and Greek rulers of this region. Of particular importance among them are the cultural communication with the rural Ashoka, through which is developed in addition to the acculturation that often distinguishes this region, an innovative development of native iconography according to the ancient Greek artistic style. We have here a very important presentation of the professor. We should never forget that many of the Greeks who set, settled mainly in the plains of the Ganges River served as mercenaries in various states of southern India. Those gradually started mixing with the native inhabitants at the 5th or uh, 7th century AD when the traces arose. The above help us understand that behind the relevant mythical activities of Osiris Dionysus, according to the evidence that has been provided, can be considered an innuendo about the expansory tendencies mainly of the Ptolemies in the East, and especially in India. The first commercial communication between the Ptolemies and India became during the reign of Ptolemy II Philadelphus. The exotic fame and wealth of the Eastern region was the great lure, especially for the Egyptian traders of the time. The development of commercial transactions between Alexandria and India, and not only we have had the connection between uh, the cultural communication between these two places uh, through the Ara Arabic Peninsula is mentioned in many sources that came from the Ptolemaic period. The main source that describes the specific course of the ships during the Syria is the text Periplus Maris Agathrae, which was considered initially to be a, a pseudograph work of Arian. On the contrary, Lion Carson, uh, in a new publication of this text, dates it between 40 to 50 AD. The Egyptians initially followed during the Syria the following route in order to reach India. They crossed East Africa via the Red Sea, and from there they reached the eastern cities of Arabia. From there, they continued their earlier journeys in India, to India. Sorry. An event that changed the course of trade during this, the late years of the reign of Ptolemy VI Philometor is the discovery of the Indian Ocean monsoons by Eudoxus of Isicus, uh, approximately 181, who, led, who had led the commercial transactions with the Ptolemies in this region since 171 BC. The discovery facilitated the movement of a movement of Egyptian ships with streets, the southern shores of Arabian uh, Peninsula, where the goods arriving from India were loaded. This fact is of particular importance for the navigation and shipping of this period and contributes to a greater development of trade. Indian products literally flooded Alexandria and certainly contributed to a, a, a special wealth of the area. After all, the Ptolemies had a monopoly on all imported exotic products. The commercial transaction continued according to several testimonies of the time, not only until the end of the dynasty of, of Ptolemies, but also during the Roman imperial age. According to Sita von Reden, quote, 
From the Hellenistic period onward, the Mediterranean economy expanded towards a two ocean system connecting the Mediterranean with the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. <clears throat> Taking all the above historical facts into account, we may state that the reference of Diodorus Siculus, according to which Osiris spread civilization in the East and India, and is thus identified with Dionysus, must be considered a Greek and not an Egyptian influence. The local character of the Egyptian myth acquires in this way a clearly ecumenical character that's connected to Diodorus' overall way of thinking according to the zeitgeist of his age. The dissemination of this kind of ideas is expected during the Ptolemaic period because the humanitarian ecumenical activity of Osiris Dionysus reflects the policies of the Egyptian monarchs. This tactic is part of the general enterprise of the new monarchs to renew the economic and the political situation of the country. This overall narrative aims through the mythic cultural achievements of Osiris Dionysus as cultural heroes, as well as mutatis mutandis, Alexander's campaign in India to maximize the Ptolemaic ideology and propaganda. In conclusion, we should not overlook that proof of this, apart from the market of relevant testimonies, is the famous procession of Ptolemy's second pilot, in which the dominant element of this association is the presence of Dionysus as the symbols. The position of this particular date in the procession is not accidental, as Dionysus considered to be uh, uh, considered the par excellence patron of the Erdian Macedonian dynasty. In this way, Ptolemy further strengthens his position as the sole and legitimate successor of Alexander. Alexander. We should not escape our notice that Dionysus constantly simultaneously the God protector of the Ptolemaic dynasty. This is yet another reason for his association with Ptolemy in this majestic procession. Another element that tends to emphasize the above relations between Dionysus and Ptolemy is the presence of the representation of Dionysus return from India. This particularly constitutes mutatis mutandis, another symbolic representation of Alexander's campaign in India. After all, Alexander, according to a related testament theory, was worshipped by his troops after he returned from India as the new Dionysus. The presence of the Indian women and Indian products in the surroundings of this procession is further evidence of all the above. Once again, the element of Ptolemy's propaganda and politics becomes obvious. All the evidence leads to the conclusion that this procession was addressed exclusively to the Greeks, the new tenders of the country of the Nile who coexisted harmoniously despite any, any existing differences in the environment of his kingdom. Thank you very much. So I'd like to open the session for uh, questions. Just a few questions, because apparently it's eleven twenty. We have we have to start with the next uh, speaker because he has an appointment. So uh, if there are questions for any of the speakers who are dealing, we've heard about uh, comparison between India, uh, Indian and Greek culture. We've heard about the question of Indianization. So the question of transforming into an Indian. Uh, modality, uh, things which were elements which were seen abroad, and generally the, the question of analogies, which is actually very interesting in itself, uh, not always focusing on influence, but parallel developments are also very important. So uh, are there questions from the... Yes, Professor yeah. yes. Thank you very much. Yes, is it? Somebody marks is at first, I'd like to thank very much the representatives of this paper, very, very important uh, papers of the three of my colleagues. Uh, the, the two were similar about the connection between uh, uh, New Platonism and uh, the Indian philosophy. And of course, uh, it was very, especially 
uh, you connect this comparison about my uh, subject comparison is very important subject of course uh, if I uh, the two uh, speakers can make this uh, the analogy that means okay there is a, a similarity we can compare we, we, it's not possible to make uh, compare uh, compare without any uh, similarity but mainly all the differences that is the main point the first for my uh, uh, remark and the second is the, this connection interconnection between as i told you also in my paper between india and alexandria is that uh, through trade and the title of this uh, uh, very important uh, uh, congress it seems this is connection between uh, trade military confrontation and political confrontation and of course now through this uh, uh, presentation cultural presentations is very important and all these connections aims to 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 to, to show the spirit of the age the late antiquity we can say the, uh, this connection and of course according to this with the theories of philosophy the gaspers the axial a time where there are a, a change in the way of thinking from the ritual to the uh, ethical way of thinking uh, according to this uh, uh, new platonism and uh, of course the brahman atman very important he reminds me the, the very important uh, 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 Saint uh, among uh, uh, father and son, what is uh, the difference between Brahman and Arset? Uh, take the uh, salt, uh, put in uh, the water, and uh, uh, make uh, this where is uh, Atman, isn't it possible to find everything is the same and uh, the, the connection? And of course, uh, this is in general, I don't like to say it along, and especially the, the, the third. Uh, um, after uh, President Baldwin, the laws that we want wonderful. I like, thank you very much, Professor. It's just extremely wonderful uh, because, of course, oh no, we know this uh, uh, sim the similarities from uh, the Buddha. Uh, we can see it here from the uh, Greek artistic uh, uh, way of uh, thinking, but all your uh, this similarity about the, this uh, flower. The atoms and the art, it's what wonderful, made provocative. It's very, very important. Of course, all of these three uh, presentations we must uh, give us an to, 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 to remark a new project about the connection, uh, especially uh, new, the new theories of social, uh, uh, social <laughs> networks. Uh, that is very important to make this this uh, project uh, a new research to give a new product because uh, uh, the word is uh, it was especially during this time that too many connected interconnected and the Greek uh, word has uh, received from in myth in mythology in artistic many things via the Ionian seeds this is the bridge between east and uh, uh, west. It, uh, all this uh, in, in culture and needs, it's, it's very, thank you very much. I'm sorry if I have talked a lot, but it was, it was very enthusiastic for what you said. Yes, uh, I actually have a, a question for Professor uh, Goswami, because uh, you brought up a very interesting point about the teacher of uh, Plotinus. Uh, called Ammonius Sarkas, and you identified the word Sarkas uh, with uh, an Indian word, or better, an attribute of Buddha. So I was wondering if you could, if if you could explain a bit more about exactly that word, if it's an adjective for a person, or if it denotes uh, something else as well. The word Sarkas Sakhi. Thank you, sir, for the question. Uh, I tried to find out that uh, what was the ammonium sakas. So uh, in India, we tell this Buddhism and the monks in Buddhism as Shakya, and uh, they belong to the cult Shakya, uh, is Gautam Buddha. So that's why we uh, try to find whether it may be some of the Buddhist monk who taught Plotinus about uh, the facts or philosophy of India 
And as Sir has told that Alexandria, I use the word cosmopolitan city at that time. So it was uh, providing a ground to Egyptian, to Hebrews, to Greeks, to Indians to assimilate one another uh, in the fields of uh, maybe philosophy, culture, history, or art. So uh, my assertion was that it may be some kind of a monk who has given some ideas to Plotinos. And because about Plotinos, we know about this, uh, uh, which uh, Sarah also, also has acclaimed this uh, NES, yes. which were the teachings of Plotinos, open teachings to Greek cult. Uh, and lectures, you can say, which has been collected in the form of panniers. And we have gathered all the information about block notes from there only. So I think there are a lot of possibilities to find new, new researches uh, about the Sakas also. And uh, if we could have an opportunity to find original texts from the Greeks, then we will try to find more apart from the panniers about the uh, plot notes. So that we can have an exact picture of that time. Thank you so much. We have time for one brief question. If someone wants to ask one last question. No, I think it's quite a bit. It's very. We must have each other. Yeah. So thank you so much. It was brilliant. Actually, wonderful. Not this idea of the use of as a uh, an ideological tool of mythology between the two worlds. It's very good uh, in the Alexandrian world and specifically the Ptolemaic world. But I have a very technical question. Uh, so, what is in your opinion? The date of uh, the Perigus of the uh, of the Red Sea. This interests me very much. You, you have said something about yes, it, but yes. yes. According to the information, was this uh, this famous uh, book of uh, Perigus Maris? It's a very a book that is. Uh, some some uh, people initially thought that was uh, uh, Aryan, but this uh, the new uh, research set is uh, a, a book in the same time because in the first century uh, AD uh, that is a compilation between the memories of traders of Roman, uh, uh, Egyptian, and Indian. It is very important to see all this this way. That I, I the, yes, yes, and I, I, I'd like to, if I may, may a short addition because because of the sort of time that I, I, I haven't uh, written, I try to short my presentation about the theory, a very important theory of Euhemerus, that is the, the base of these ideas that the, uh, on his book uh, on uh, here, I am going to put uh, the sacred uh, uh, writing said of the, the gods were uh, kings of the one given the all these goods to be for this uh, your gods. And in the, in the part, this this is very important this theory uh, because uh, the, according to the other said this uh, uh, propaganda uh, for the divine uh, Ptolemy or the all the kings, but later. The Christian writers, like Council, we are said, aha, this is the, the, the this text says that there is the, the Greek the, uh, mystical verse is false. There is no God, only one God there is. And this is it. Thank you very much. I, I think I, I need to invite Professor Pakis back to the podium because you're sharing the next session. Uh, because the next speaker is going to be online in two minutes or one minute. So, thank you. Thank you. Well, we are going for the third session. And for part of Dr. Pakis, and I will call uh, Professor Pascal Sandrudis from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, who will speak about Byzantium in India, aspect of trade and culture from 5th to 12th century uh, BC. Thank uh, you very much, uh, Professor.
Uh, I apologize for this inconvenience. Um, I had to change my plans for uh, today. So I'll try to share uh, my screen. Um, can you see it? Uh, yes, yes. I'll try to connect. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. Ah, yeah. Yes, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, um, as, uh, as far as I can see, um, the topic of uh, relations between Byzantium and India is um, yet uh, unexplored. But uh, in my paper, I will try to present some aspects of uh, relation, commercial relations and um, um, aspects of uh, culture from 5th to 12th century. And uh, as Professor Pahis uh, noted before, it is known from classical literature, especially from uh, the work Periplus Maris Eritrei that has been traded between the Roman Empire and India. Um, from the first century uh, BC onwards. Uh, let's how, uh, see how the products from India arrived in Byzantium, the Red Sea Indian Ocean trade line in widespread use since antiquity was also used in Byzantine times. Uh, we know the Red Sea ports uh, in which reached the products of Arabia, East Africa and distant India. Uh, in Klisma, an important Byzantine port of the region, arrived incense from Yemen, cassia from Somalia, mir, aloe, and all the perfumes in demand. The island of Iotavi, with the famous Byzantine imperial customs, together formed with the city of Phile and Klisma, the tr triangle of traffic control and trade between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. The kingdom of Aftsomi, now Ethiopia, with the port of Adulis on the west coast of the Red Sea, organized expeditions to India and received African products, which it then re-exported. The Greek inscription of Adulis testify for the presence of many Greeks in it. There, um, uh, for a journey to the east, uh, uh, both uh, Sopatros and Scholasticus uh, took uh, the same itinerary. Cosmas, the Indicoplevs, uh, Cosmas who sailed to India, um, a sixth century Greek merchant traveler who presenting himself as an importer of spices, traveled for a long time to the Red Sea and perhaps further afield to India, writing his uh, Christianity topographia, Christian topography. His work dated around uh, 50, uh, 550 contains some of the earliest and most uh, famous maps. His description of Phidia and Ceylon during the sixth century is invaluable to historians, but it cannot be ascertained uh, that he really visited um, uh, these lands. However, he mentioned several ports on the Malabar coast, South India, as well as Soriyani Christians in present day Kerala in India. I will not uh, um, um, uh, I have a text of him, but I will not present it. Um, uh, after the Muslim co conquest of the uh, 7th century, the Byzantine commerce with the East uh, declined and uh, new trade routes uh, have to be found. Uh, we know the northern route via Caspian Sea or uh, the projects, uh, projects uh, that were uh, in trade with uh, Byzantium it's uh, now um, Byzantium uh, through this route or the intermediation of Arab uh, traders. Um, ivory uh, was a product uh, par excellence of India, which along uh, with ivory from Africa reached Byzantium. From the early Christian period, we have a depiction of Indians in this uh, panel. We see the famous uh, uh, the so-called Barberini diptych in Louvre. And um, the bottom panel forms uh, a sort of frieze decorated by double procession of barbarians and animals converging on a central figure of uh, victory. 
uh, she's turned to look up uh, upwards uh, towards uh, the figure of uh, the emperor on the central panel and holds in her right hand a military trophy represented in the traditional form of a branch with military arms, armor, and booty fixed to it. The defeated barbarians uh, carry to the emperor various gifts as tribute and are differentiated by their clothes and by the wild animals who accompany them. To the left, two headed figures. Um, bearded figures, excuse me, are of the same type as the barbarian in the central panel, wearing short tunics, Phrygian caps, and closed boats. One of them wears a crown, the, uh, the other cylindrical container with unknown contents, perhaps gold, and the head man walks uh, uh, a lion. There may be Persians or Scythians. To the right, um, the two barbarians. Um, in parentheses, are dressed very differently, nude from the waist up. They wear a fabric headdress heightened by feed, feed feathers, a simple piece of fabric tied at the waist and sandals. They are accompanied by a tiger and small elephant. The first bears an elephant's tusk on his shoulder and the second the baton of unknown function. They represent Indians. According to Charles Delvoix, uh, the presence of vassals, barbarians, and Indians at the bottom of the central panel suggests that the emperor should be identified with Anastasius I uh, as he had received an Indian embassy in uh, 496 and had defeated the gods two uh, years earlier. Moving later on, uh, we have the famous uh, history of Barlame Yoasafat, also known as Bilahar and Budasaf. Uh, which are legendary Christian saints. Their life story was based on the life of Gautama Buddha and tell us uh, of the conversion of Jehoshaphat to Christianity. According to the legend, the Indian king persecuted the Christian church in his realm. After astrologers predicted that his own son would someday become a Christian, the king imprisoned the young prince Jehoshaphat, who nevertheless met the hermit Saint Barlam and converted to Christianity. After much tribulation, the young prince's father accepted the Christian faith, turned over his throne to Jehoshaphat, and retired to the desert to become a hermit. Jehoshaphat himself later abdicated and went into seclusion with his old teacher Barlam. Uh, the first uh, Christianized adaptation was the Georgian epic. Bala Variani, which dates back to the 10th century. And uh, a Georgian monk, Ephemius of Athos, translated the story into Greek. Then the two uh, saints uh, were incorporated in, uh, uh, in uh, the feast of uh, the Orthodox Church, and even we can find some frescoes depicting them. Uh, this is from 14th century Serbia, St. Varlam, St. Yoasaf who became in Yoasaf and some other depictions of uh, the saints. And um, the, the story uh, became uh, widespread in uh, many, many other countries. And um, we have also uh, depictions in the Mongol era. Last but not least is uh, this uh, casket is uh, a royal um, secular uh, Byzantine casket, uh, uh, which is preserved in Darmstadt. And um, where we have four panels of this casket, which represent uh, episodes of uh, the Romans, the famous Romans of Alexander. Uh, these uh, panels were uh, erroneously uh, in my opinion, dated around 9th century. But uh, if we examine the iconography and the spread of um, the Romans of Alexander in the secular uh, court of Constantinople, which was around the uh, second half of 11th and 12th century, probably can uh, date this uh, casket in uh, 12th, uh, 12th century and not uh, earlier. Um, we have the front panels and the side uh, panels. Uh, in one side panel, we have the famous ascension of Alexander the Great, but it's not in its typical uh, position, let's say, with uh, two uh, batons uh, carrying the food for uh, griffins. And um, uh, 
uh, which is uh, the interesting is uh, in the of Alexander in um, uh, hermits and naked hermits, uh, probably, uh, in my opinion, they present uh, gymnosophists, uh, the Brahmans, uh, people from uh, India, the famous ascetics from India, and uh, in my opinion, have representation, of, have an allusion to India in this uh, sense, uh, a fact that is not um, written in this um, the, the studies of uh, the casket. And if we search uh, some other, the, I, I have in mind some other representation uh, of people in uh, other works of art, especially secular works of art. And um, um, I'll give uh, more documentation uh, in the proceedings of uh, the conference. Uh, thank you so much um, for this. Uh, for accepting me to speak at that time and for this in inconvenience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Anzaloulis. Thank you also for your presentation. Uh, it was shorter than the time. Okay, now we can make this an uh, intermission for 10 minutes. That means that uh, it's uh, 11.30 till uh, 40. 11.40, please come again exactly to the start. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes.
Страхно кой няма да се запита ли е тук? Ако кой има? Има сега, да. Аз съм тазих на стъбата. Шейнта програма. Шейне. Не е Next Okay. Okay. It's not Okay, we will start, please. Uh, uh, the next speaker is Professor uh, Arzana Sarma from the Department of English in the University of uh, Delhi. The film recording cultural heritage, ancient Greece, ancient India, and historical and civilizational interconnection. Thank you very much. I have 40 minutes here, Professor. Thank you. Um, so good morning again. And uh, I'd like to thank and begin with gratitude. Um, many, many appreciations for the Institute, not only for the conference, but for hosting us for all these days and continuing to extend uh, great care that we are taking care of. Um, it's been very nice meeting. Um, people from all over the world actually who have come. In some ways, uh, interactions began before the conference because we had conversations with each other. And also, I'd like to thank uh, Iswini Panabogodu, who has been very, very kind in, uh, in her interactions with me because I'm not a historian, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm not a philologist, I'm not a Greek person, so I'm several knots. But I'm still here. I'd also like to personally thank uh, Dr. Nalan Kumar Singh because he has been in many ways essential to my being here today to actually do a fair amount of learning. So this is a kind of movement through literature into the area of interactions and interconnections and civilization dialogues. I'm going to be speaking about people who are not Greeks to talk about Greece and India, uh, they are overwhelmingly British. Because the hypothesis, if you want to say, or the point that I'm trying to make is, look at multiple strands. The strand of Greece as an ancient civilization, the strand of India or Bharat, as it is now being called, as an ancient civilization, and its mediation and reconstruction renegotiation and recasting through the British vision. So it is the empire, uh, which is the way in which I'm going to look at the way this 
So I'm looking at the last part, which was the 18th century, because it's in the 18th century that we start reimagining how the world is constructed, what were the nature of the circulations, networks, engagement, uh, because many of the speakers before me have spoken beautifully about engagements that are millennia old. But the interesting point is the overlay of those networks, connections, conversations, dialogues, histories through the eyes of what we see as British imperial thought and British colonial thought to begin with. Um, I have spoken in part on this in an earlier conference, which was a conference on Greek philosophy in the university, where I was again asked to come and speak. And the argument that I really uh, sort of that emerged from my an own understanding is that it doesn't matter uh, where you are uh, territorially colonized or not. So one ancient civilization from which I come was territorially civilized. I'm using civilized in quotation marks, colonized uh, by the British Empire. Greece is not technically colonized. But the effect of colonization of Greece through British thought, ideas, and the vast amount of material that has been put out on Greek philosophy, on Greek aesthetics, on Greek literature, multiple aspects of Greek thought, and of course, Indian thought, have meant that now we look at these conversations, these interactions, these interconnections to a ruptured lens, the lens of colonial rule. 200 years of history has changed at least three millennia of interactions. And I think it's something we need to think about when we are looking at the way we are working towards reviving essentially this conference, and I'm sure the one before it in Jenu and others that may follow, I think are means of rediscovery and revival of ancient, very powerful, very strong linkages that existed. But over 200 years of imperial colonial thought, I'm not just talking about rule, these interactions have altered in such a significant material way that they now need to be, in some ways, almost re excavated, uh, not archaeologically, but ideationally, and that is what, in part, I'm going to talk about the British intervention uh, in the ways in which these twin cultures have, as uh, I've sort of been arguing, been reimagined, and the narratives around them have been completely uh, divorced or removed from originally narratives that were there. Uh, now, the person that I'm going to speak about in brief before I launch off, and uh, please uh, stop me uh, when my time is up because uh, I'm used to two hour lectures. So you have to be very firm with me. I'll take directions very quickly from you. Um, so the person I'm looking at is Sir William Jones. In India, some people do know his name. Um, he was, uh, he was an amazing person in the late 18th century who studied at Oxford, so that would delight you, young person who gave the keynote yesterday. <laughs> yes, um, because he was an Oxford scholar uh, who was multilingual. Uh, he was a legal specialist. Um, he knew a lot, and he was tasked by East India Company um, and requested by Sir Warren Hastings, who was the Governor General at that point in Kolkata in the late 18th century, to come and understand actually Indian law, which defined description uh, because there were no written documents that could be used. And legal systems, as we all understand, are the bulwark of governance and control. This is what he was sent for. What transpires is something else uh, because he was not just a bureaucrat. So when Oriental, and his, he's also called not just William Jones, he's called Oriental Jones. When Oriental Jones sailed to Calcutta in 1783, he was already a distinguished pedigreed scholar, 
and a Sorbonne, whose ideas were rooted in multiple cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitanism, as we know, is not new. It's just the terminology has come about now. Um, and these cosmopolitanisms were ancient Greece, some Rome, but Rome, as we know, is deeply predicated on its knowledge of Greece. The mighty Roman Empire would not have existed if they had not conquered and had interactions with the Greeks, which became the base for them in advancing, not just in terms of military prowess, but in terms of intellectual and knowledge systems. So he was well versed in Greece. He was well versed in Persian and Arabic cultures. The new movement in his ideal system came in 1783 when he sailed to the shores of Calcutta in Eastern India. And there are accounts about how this maritime journey, as he moves across several continents, across several seas, impacts the way he starts thinking about culture, exchange, interactions, historicity, layered narratives. And so when he comes to India, he encounters a language which seems to be even older than what Western civilization regards as the significant older language, uh, which is you know, basically Greek and then Latin. He encounters Sanskrit. And Sanskrit becomes then the great philological, ideational, critical tool by which William Jones actually does what we call today comparative studies. So the domain of comparative studies, as many of us know, developed in the 18th and 19th century, it does not exist prior to that. So this domain of comparative studies, if I was to say one of the early contributors, significant contributors is William Jones. And in 1783, he starts without knowing it, embarking on the field of comparative studies. And Sanskrit then, the discovery of Sanskrit, becomes a very important way of connecting what we describe as Occidental and Oriental, both deeply problematic terms. And Sanskrit then becomes the tool with which he tries to connect his prior systems of knowledge, rooted largely in Greek language and literature and philosophy and aesthetics, with the discovery of another deep culture, which is also rooted in a linguistic system, which is Sanskrit. So his initial work is largely philological, in which, of course, as we know, he's, he creates the whole Indo-Aryan uh, language system, where he tries to find connections between what is considered the bulwark of Western civilization, which is Greek. Without the Greeks, Britain would not exist, because Unlike other European countries who do have deeper cultures, the important thing is Britain doesn't actually have a deep culture. It is, we don't think of it like that now because we have the United States of America, which is the youngest. But it is important for us to recall that Britons, as they were interacting from the 16th century onwards with other cultures, while doing very well on many fronts, were also extremely anxious because they recognized that there are many deep cultures with deep knowledge systems, which they are not aware of. Persia, Greek, they knew. Rome, they knew. Sanskrit is, is the great, it's like the last mile. It's that area of which it has to be reached. So uh, William Jones does what actually best on Sanskrit is today in the world, Sheldon Pollock, who is at the University of Chicago, still does. He went to Banaras found a partner and learned Sanskrit. It is through the eyes of William Jones that I am going to be looking at this interaction. So his travels across, as I said, these various maritime structures is the ways in which he starts connecting. So it's not only, of course, we know that the connections have taken place between goods and people and ideas prior to this, but it is William Jones who starts sort of creating what I would call a narrative of heritage and then reconstructing it. And today's task, at least for me, very briefly, is to decode this heritage and heritage management. Heritage, as we are all aware, we are sitting in Venice and there is a lot of politics around the heritage of Venice. 
And who does Venice actually belong to? Because it belongs to so many people. In that sense, it's a world city. So when we're looking at this segment, we have to understand that making of heritage is also the means by which you construct, control, and dominate in terms of power relationships. So this, this identity, which has been constructed for the British as they're interacting with other cultures, is the identity, which is how do you construct a British identity? Because British identity is in flux. It does not have a very deep, as I have been arguing, sense. So you construct it via, this is too soon. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I asked for it. But the British identity is, is constructed from William Jones onwards through their discovery, their reframing of both the Greek culture and the Sanskrit culture. And it is this reframing that we are now dealing. We are consequence. Our own engagements with each other have, as I said, been overlaid by the colonial narrative which has been so powerful. Why is it so powerful? Because they were great producers of literature, of works that were printed. So the advent of print culture actually completely changes ideas of manuscript culture and ideas of orality. So orality and manuscript culture are now replaced by the dominance of print culture. The minute you have print culture, what have you done? You have a fixed meaning. And that meaning can no longer then be challenged or questioned. So the domination, so what the British Empire does is it has a whole series of people who are creating these narratives, who are then writing them, which are then being printed and then being circulated across the British Empire network. So for instance, how does he do the connections? I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. You were speaking about Dionysus earlier. He also speaks about Dionysus, but I won't go there. So uh, many people know the Indian epic Mahabharata, and the principal character is neither the Pandavas nor the Pauravs. The principal character is Lord Krishna. Now, how does Jones understand Krishna? He says Krishna is the Indian Apollo. So it becomes very interesting how you are going to uh, sort of look at this area. I just will say four things, four ideas that I'd like you to think about and we can talk about them later, is why is this activity, this very clearly targeted process, diplomatic, I, I, because it is diplomatic, activity that the British undertake, what were the four legs or the four strands of it? Taxonomy, naming and identifying, translations. When you translate, you can give new meanings, you can excise, you can do whatever you wish to. Museumization, which I haven't got to, but that is 18th century, 19th century. The minute you have museumization, you have done something else to living heritage. And yesterday's uh, address by um, Janus uh, was very interesting. Uh, Yamir, by the way was very interesting because what British Museum and other museums have are Greek sculpture and statuary and Buddhist sculpture and statuary, all narrativized, presented as if it is to be seen through the eyes who have discovered them, which are the British eyes. So thank you very much. Exactly. <laughs> That's very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Sarma. It was a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. And now go on with the presentation of two colleagues, uh, Professor uh, Filippo Ronconi, Director of the Institute the, 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 uh, the, uh, Sounds uh, Paris and uh, my colleague uh, Christo Sarabat, Professor Christo Sarabat, that's uh, the Faculty of uh, Theology at Stanford University. The two colleagues of mine, uh, they have, they are two, 30 minutes before. Okay, <laughs> for 15. Okay, please.
uh, we are not going to see for 40 minutes, but 30 will be enough. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you, Professor Pagis, and please let me express my gratitude and admiration to the Hellenic Institute for organizing this wonderful occasion of interaction. It is an extraordinary pleasure to lecture in front of such a distinguished delegation of Indian and European colleagues. So this lecture by Professor Arabatsis and myself is divided into two parts. Uh, the first, okay. The first comparative in nature concerns the anthropology of happiness and the theme of light in India and especially Byzantium. The second focuses on contexts, especially cultural and textual which we will attempt to analyze by dwelling on some works and their manuscript tradition. So in the written, in the written reference, we will develop a comparison of what might be called the anthropology of happiness in the Byzantine and Indian cultures, assuming that we can really speak of them as true unitary cultures. Following some scholars, these similarities might imply a common Indo-European substratum that would have nourished on the one hand, the philosophical thought of Greece and subsequently of Rome and Byzantium, and on the other, ancient and medieval India. Concepts such as apathy, equanimity, form the core of Epicurean and Stoic thought, and along with the theme of introspection and the search for inner balance, they are common ground with the Indian meditative tradition. As noted by Marie Pierre Delegue, what the Greeks met in India at the time of Alexander the Great was not entirely new from a philosophical point of view. Abstinence from animal flesh was important for Pythagoreans in Sicily, was treated in Athens, in the Platonic Academy and in Aristotelian circles. Pythagoreans, the followers of Orphism and Plato, to put just some examples, considered, just like the followers of Buddhism, that the soul, judged according to its merits in this life, reincarnated until the final deliverance, thus leaving the cycles of time and reaching a state somehow similar to Nirvana. Following some other scholars, these similarities might come from direct influences. Stoicism would then bear the direct imprint of Buddhism, and symmetrically, Ashoka Siddhics would reflect Greek ethics as they are found in the Aikanum inscription. We heard the suggestive lectures of Dr. Segalerba and Professor Anita Goswami somehow uh, starting from Seberg's hypothesis concerning the Indian origins of ammonio sacas has highlighted the probable influences of Indian thought on Neoplatonism. After all, in the same period, Flavius Philostratus writes that Apollonius of Diana had learned much about divine wisdom from the Brahmins. The discourse is even more complex for the Byzantine period, which has been less studied from this point of view, and on which the written version of this lecture reposes. In both traditions, the human being is called upon to discover his true self and thus to shape his path towards true happiness by questioning the role of material wealth and by self-limitation as a tool for inner fulfillment, which in some Byzantine traditions is far removed from theoretical ramblings. The attitude is the result of awareness, which is gradually acquired through asceticism, much more than to be located. In both Indian and Byzantine ascetical thoughts, all areas of human life and activity refer directly or indirectly to a transcendent reality, which through a meditative approach and or thanks to a revealed truth is supposed to shape the limits and goals of human experience. In both traditions, as noted by Professor Gosvani and Dr. Segalerba, the Atman and the soul as light builders derive from an absolute and transcendent reality represented by a divine personal principle in the one case and an impersonal principle in the other. Both Byzantine ascetics and Indian philosophers saw the human being not only as an organism with biological characteristics or as the complex matter of Aristotle, Sinolosusia, but also and above all as a being with the potential to achieve communion and coexistence with the transcendent. 
And given that the world as a physical reality and history are the contexts that shape the human activity and experience, they constitute the limits from which human beings should escape. Consequently, spiritual well being requires minimizing the relationship with the world and its norms and avoiding the fulfillment of material pleasures. Beatitude is therefore an active state defined by rational and intellectual capacities based on a metaphysical or theocentric conception of human nature. The human being as a psychophysical organism feels the tension between corporality and spiritual and spiritual functions, and this only ends with the death of the body and the final liberation of the soul. In both traditions, light plays a central role from this point of view. And for Byzantium, this is partially due to the neoplatonic roots of Byzantine theology and philosophy. Even if the source of the light is deeply different in the two traditions, the relationship with these lights as an energetic event that determines the entry into a higher ontological state probably constitutes the most characteristic analogy between the spiritual experience of the Byzantines and the Indians. And I refer once again to uh, Professor Gojwani's lecture. Even more strikingly, if we move on from the theoretical framework to the practices put in place to achieve this union with light, we find that the prerequisite for experiencing the light is in both cases a form of meditation which aims at purifying the sensory organs and suppressing habits and patience. In both cultures, a spiritual guide is necessary, at least in the first stage of this journey. In short, even if the two traditions start from different perspectives, they present striking analogies in terms of theorization of human potential, of the inner experience of light, and of the anthropological dimension of asceticism. The final consideration for this first part of our talk concerns the nature of the texts we are dealing with in the two cultures. In both traditions, took place a process of progressive textual stratification and harmonization. In Byzantium, starting at least from the Alexandrian school of Clement and Origen, the biblical message is composed with ancient Greek philosophical thought, and later this mass of information is completed by adding new elements taken from different contexts. Let us think of Evagrius or of the ascetics of Gaza and Sinai. A similar progressive dynamic process applies to their mission. Nevertheless, we are dealing here with two quite different types of literary compositions. In the Indian case, they look like being more like anonymous compilations, whereas in Byzantium, they are generally texts compiled by others who gather different materials in the systematic and personal presentation, which often explicitly distinguishes previous elements and new additions. Even if it is always necessary to be quite careful in comparative approach, as it has been said, the two ascetic traditions of Byzantium and India, with their own methods, sensibilities, intellectual tools, delved into the same dark areas of the unconscious and its structures, and probably many analogies are simply due to this. But the similarities in some ascetical practices might derive from some direct contacts, which can only be detected by analyzing texts. We can then introduce the second section of our lecture, which is more extensive and, so to speak, interactionist. It will start from the very beginning. But our focus will be on Byzantium and medieval India. In fact, as we shall remind often, the ancient Greek texts we are going to mention have come down to us thanks to Byzantine manuscripts and Byzantine milieu who were interested in their transcription, and we will try to understand why. Before Alexander the Great's campaigns in Asia, India belonged to the sphere of myth, especially concerning the adventures of Dionysus and Hercules, as stated by Professor Pallis, was brilliantly shown how the spectrum went on being used as an ideological tool in the following centuries. The few Greek authors of the 6th, 5th century before current era treated this area 
generally relating quite fantastic tales concerning animal and peoples, peoples with only one leg and a foot so big it could be used as an umbrella, or one-eyed people, etc. Let us think about the uh, uh, Skylax of Carianda and Theseus of Naius. These older fragments have been fortunately preserved by the Byzantines, especially in the middle period, who were quite interested in paradoxography, as we shall see. Nevertheless, the pre-Hellenistic period also encompasses faithful authors, geographers, logographs, like Ecatius of Miletus and Herodotus. The latter and Theseus precisely situate India at the end of the inevitable herd. And all these authors agree in considering the Indians to be the most numerous people in the world, composed of a variety of ethnic groups with different customs. They also agree on the gigantic size of Indian animals. The first historical traces of Indian pharmacology appear in the Hippocratic collection, which mentions an Indian plant to be identified with pepper. These are all the occurrences in the Hippocratic collection, uh, which have been studied by Alan White and uh, Emanuela Petit. The quality of the data, anyway, radically changed after Alexander's campaigns as philosophers, geographers, explorers, historians accompanied this field of Aristotle. The pre-skeptic philosopher Anaxarchus and the skeptic Piro, the official historian and scientist Callisthenes, the cynic philosopher Rhesicritus, among many others, captured, albeit imperfectly, information about geography, botany, zoology, geology, and certain local traditions with varying degrees of credibility. The data they collected had partially come down to us thanks to later historians and geographers like Arianus, Strabo, Diodorus of Sicily, Plutarch, whose works have been preserved through copies or extracts made in Constantinopolitan scholarly circles of the mid-Byzantine period often linked to the imperial cult. Even if Alexander went no farther than the Indus, refraining from entering the heart of India, some of these authors noted, maybe indirectly, the social role of ascetics, thus starting to make the self-control of Brahmins very famous in the West. When, well after Alexander the Great, the new Maharaja dynasty, the bright ascetics of the Indian territories, the Indian kings and especially Sandrakotus, sorry for this uh, Latinization of the name, <laughs> and Ashoka came into contact with the Hellenistic state of the West and the embassies were sent to the capitals of the Indian Empire, Padamputra. Towards the end of the fourth century before Tarantira, the ethnographer and explorer Megasthenes was sent as an ambassador by Seleucus the first Nicator to Sandrakotus and visited some Indian regions, possibly Punjab. He was the first Westerner to highlight, though imperfectly, the division of Indian society into castes, he spoke of only two castes. But the Hellenistic states were engaged in a kind of diplomatic competition. Dimachus was sent to the son of Sandrakotus by the Seleucid sovereign Antiochus the first of here, and following Pliny the Elder, Dionysius, a certain Dionysius, was sent to the same sovereign or to Ashoka by Ptolemy the Second to Adelphus. Shortly after 250 before Carantira, the state of Bactria was born as the result of a secession from the Seleucid state. From around 200, it reached as far south as the Ganges and beyond the Indus estuary. Its king Menander, who reigned towards the middle of the second century, before Tarantira is well known thanks to the Melinda Pania, but I will refrain from speaking of this uh, and wait to hear from Professor Raymond uh, Schubert. The decline of the Greek kingdoms in the following period does not seem to have involved an immediate social cultural upheaval. Greeks continued to live in these regions, particularly in the cities founded by Alexander and his successors. By the time of Augustus, the first century before, in the first century before Carantira, trade between India and the newborn Roman Empire flourished. And some decades later, 
knowledge of India, drawn on India, dramatically increased, and this connection between trade and cultural knowledge has been uh, highlighted, and it's quite always quite important, really. In the Naturalis Historia, Pliny the Elder reports about emissaries from Sion to Rome during the reign of Emperor Claudius in the middle of the first century. And probably towards the end of the same century was written or compiled the Pericus of the Eritrean Sea, which has been quoted. Now, it is worth noting that this text is known to us thanks to a 9th century Constantinopolitan manuscript preserved in Heidelberg. This manuscript belongs to the so called philosophical collection, a group of 19 manuscripts containing Platonic, Aristotelian, Neoplatonic works partially stemming from ancestors, which belong to the library of an Alexandrian philosophical school of late antiquity. In this manuscript, the Pericles is covered with other similar texts in a geographical section, as you can see, which is followed by a paradoxographical section, a sign that the late antique Alexandrian models strictly associated with the two germs, geography and paradoxography, when it came to the Far East, and the same did the Byzantines, as we shall see. The Perigus is an account of a maritime exploration involving the main trade routes from the Roman Egyptian ports on the coast of the Red Sea to the ports of East Africa and India. Greeks who lived in these areas operated as merchants or mercenary guards for the local rulers, as witnessed by the Roman coins from second and first and second centuries, the current era found there, and by the poems of the local Tamils, who mentioned the ships of the Yavanas who bought pepper in exchange for gold. The Tamil rulers hired Westerners as personal guards and fortress guards, since they were known to be brave soldiers and excellent craftsmen. The intensity of combats at this time is implied on the Greek side by architecture, town planning, numismatics, and, but I do not want to enter the domain illustrated by Professor Bina Kumar, on the Indian side by the syncretism between ancient Greek art and Babylon. Thanks to the intermediation of these Greek speaking communities, uh, okay, um, um, information on India continued to reach the West and was collected, among others, by Strabo in the first century and Claudius Ptolemy in the second century, who was able to obtain precise geographical information on East Asia. At the beginning of the third century, the first Christian texts began to deal with the religious tradition of the Indians, and Clement of Alexandria mentions the name of Buddha in his Stromatus. Around 235, Hippolytus describes the doctrine, doctrine of the Brahmins in this reputation of all else. His text seems to blend the teachings of the Upanishads, the Greek Jews' Hermeticism of Alexandria, the cynic historic doctrines. What's more, the authenticity of ideas attributed to Indians in a number of Greek texts of this period even in semi-medical works such as Philostratus' Life of Apollonius of Diana, proves that accurate information did indeed reach the Western world in the early centuries of Christian era. Nevertheless, in the third century, the Roman Empire went through an institutional, social, political, cultural transformation, and this affected trade routes, the management of capital, the mobility of goods, trade with India no longer seemed to be almost a Roman monopoly, but was instead controlled by other peoples generally located farther east, like Persians, Ethiopians, or Iraq. The partial resumption of trade between Egyptian ports, South India, and Sivan is recorded from the fourth century onwards and is confirmed by the coins of emperors Theodosius I, Arcadius, and Donatus found in these eastern regions. The institutional, political, military, economic reorganization of the empire 
And mostly the transfer of the capital from Rome to Constantinople, which is in a, a strategic position towards the East, uh, implied the resumption of diplomatic relations with the East. Eusebius and Damianus Marcellinus report the arrival of ambassadors from India, Sidon, and Maldives who visited Constantine the Great and his neighbor, the Emperor of Julian. Maldives and Lacadives were of strategic importance for the Byzantines of this period. Following the 4th, 5th century ecclesiastical history of Philostorius, the certain Theophilus, known as the Indian, who was born on one of these islands, was taken as a prisoner to the Byzantine Empire at a very young age, at the time of Emperor Constantine the Great. Then he became an Aryan bishop of the Church of Ethiopia and an ambassador to the Homerites in Southern Arabia. This implies that the Byzantines secured the bases for their fleets in islands belonging to the Indian Ocean. Another source of great interest, which despite many studies deserves further investigation, is a text on the peoples of India uh, and the Brahmins. It presents itself as a lecture by Palladius of Elenosis, a very well-known bishop born in the fourth century and author of a, an influential text, Historia Lausiaca. This text, this letter, is addressed to an anonymous senior Christian figure. Though the identification of the author with Palladius has been disputed, there is no reason to reject it. And even if the text is generally considered to be composed of two sections, it consists, in fact, of five parts. A general introduction in which Palladius states that he only arrived to the Ganges River with Moses, Bishop of Adubis. An introduction of the account of an official, Scholaticos, from Thebes in Egypt, who traveled to India, reaching the land of the Visades, possibly in the region of Assam, where he was taken hostage and lived for some years, and who after his release went back to Egypt, where Palladius met him. Three, the traveler's account focused on the Brahmins and their way of life. Four, the transitional sentence introducing the following section attributed to Arian. And five, a long section allegedly taken from Arian featuring a dialogue between Alexander the Great and the Indian sage Dandanus, which is presented as a narration by Dandanus himself. This part is quite interesting, might be in some relationship with a quite fragmentary second, third century papyrus preserved in Geneva, which contains precisely the fragments of a dialogue between Alexander and Dandanus. Palladius' text, this whole text, did not enjoy a large confusion in this answer. It is found in no more than 41 Greek manuscripts, only 17 of which have been certainly copied before the fall of Constantinople. In many of these manuscripts, no more than one or two folios contain isolated fragments of the work. Furthermore, it is rarely presented as an autonomous text, being often appended to the Lausia history as an introduction or an appendix. Be that as it may, this text was a reward, probably in the fifth or sixth century, resulting in two different versions, and was translated into Latin probably four times, but only one translation survives, which is pretended as a translation by Ambrose of Milan, the great Western saint and differs, this translation differs from the Greek versions in some decisive points. First of all, after the general title, in which, as you see, the text is uh, uh, attributed to Ambrose, Dicta Sancti Ambrosi De Vita Bragmanorum, after this general text, uh, you can read the partial title, which goes, Commonitorium Palladium. So there is an attribution to Palladius somehow. Uh, nevertheless, in part, in the first part, you remember I, I divided the text in five, the Greek version in five parts. But in the first part, 
the Latin text is not presented as written by Palladius, but as addressed to Palladius by an anonymous author. In the second part, the author introduces the account by the Theban Scholasticos indirectly, that is, as if it had been transmitted to him by Museus, which in the Greek text is the guide of Palladius to the Ganges. In the fourth part, which in the Greek version introduces, introduces Arian, there is another sentence in which the author notes that he is sending with Arian a commonitorium. Finally, the last part opens with a title, which once again refers the text to Ambrose, as you see, Vita Bragmanorum Sancti Ambrosi. Um, this part, which in the Greek version is presented as, uh, as by Tandalis himself, um, is not presented as a presentation by Tandalis in the Latin version. So there is another. So we have dwelt on these details because, in our opinion, this Latin translation was made starting from an earlier version of the Greek text than all those that have survived. The study of the Latin translation, and the, a new edition is underway, could therefore allow us to reconstruct a textual stage very close to the original Greek text, which was evidently a kind of dossier made of different independent parts. In retracing this whole story, one will also have to take into account the almost complete Arabic translation discovered some weeks ago, some months ago, by Adrian Pirta, Pirtea in a Sinaitic Karabic manuscript, probably copied in Egypt in the 13th century. Let us just note in the end that the version of the Greek text was also interpolated in between of the recension, two recension of the uh, Roman Alexander by Pseudo-Calisthenes, so that it can be read in the magnificent manuscript of the Institute that we all know so well, which can be dated to the 14th century and so on. I go on this very well. So um, I, I will cut a little bit and go to the end. Eh? Though silk from China was well known in Rome, at least from the time, from the first century, it was in the sixth century. Sixth century is a key, is a key moment uh, for the connections between Byzantium and China. It was in the sixth century that the ability to produce the silk in the West was imported from India to the Persians, that is by the land road in the north. We all remember Procopius' story, following which uh, in the sixth century, Emperor Justinian received at the court some monks coming from the north of India, who, I quote, had learned accurately by what means it was possible for silk to be produced. Furthermore, in the sixth century, settlers from Syria and Mesopotamia arrived in India. Nestorianism began to spread in the region and in other Asian countries. Not by chance, the Byzantine author who provides the most information on India dates back to 6th century, Cosmas and Nicoplastis, and he was quoted, so I can put short. I just want to note that the work of Cosmas, which is quite important to us today, uh, is only preserved in six Byzantine manuscripts. And the harsh judgment of Father Fortunes of Constantinople, who was a great, a very learned man, can explain why Byzantines did not like this text. Pozzo says, the style is poor, the arrangement hardly up to the ordinary standard. He relates much that is incredible from an historical point of view, so that he may fairly be regarded as a fabulist rather than a trustworthy author. Nevertheless, Cosmas' conception of the universe and of the earth had a certain importance in some Byzantine milieu. And there is a beautiful uh, Vatican manuscript of the ninth century. Well, I, I, I could, the last phrase to end, a mythical land for the archaic Greeks, the homeland of colonists after Alexander the Great, and an immense market for the Romans and Byzantines of the early period. India was a constant and discreet point of reference for uh, Greek, Latin, and Syro-speaking Westerners, 
who, depending on the period and the social level, saw in this mysterious area a commercial opportunity, a part of the world to be explored, the homeland of medical plants and traditions, a reservoir of paradoxical stories, and a central reference concerning philosophy and asceticism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, uh, Ronconi. After uh, your both uh, excellent uh, presentation, really excellent, very extensive, we would like to hear and hear and uh, talk and talk. And uh, now, coming the next uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Dolphin Lauritsen or Lauritsen, uh, Saint Epistoire de Division de Vesans, uh, Paris. Uh, with the title Metapsychosis in Normus of Anopolis Dionysiaca. Very interesting. Grazie. <laughs> <laughs> to the authorities, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation to participate in the second issue of this Indian Greek conferences, which are producing such a rich collaboration. My paper focuses on a period which is key to understand the relation between India and the Greek world. In the Mediterranean, the 5th, 6th centuries common era marks the passage from the ancient world of Greco-Roman antiquity to Byzantium. At the same moment in India, the Gupta Empire rises. The parallelism in terms of change of civilization is striking. In both cases, we witness the profound transformation of the past into a new horizon. An exceptional work of Greek literature originates from this context. The Genesiaca of Nonos of Panopolis in Egypt is a very long poem of over 20,000 verses. Examiner is in itself a very long verse, as it can reach up to 17 syllables. It is divided into 48 books, twice 24, i.e. the length of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey put together. As indicated by its title, Dionysiaca, this epic poem focuses on the ventures of the god of wine, Dionysus Bacchus. The main action is Dionysus going to India and fighting against the local rulers. This narrative occupies books 13 to 40, that is to say about 60% of the entire poem, 28 books. Just to give an idea of the transmission of the text, on the left, uh, the illustration, you find the main manuscripts, which is kept in Florence, in Italy, in the Biblioteca Lorenziana, and it dates of the end of the 13th century. And uh, below, I put you uh, a fragment of the oldest witness of the text that reached us, dating back to the beginning of the 6th century, a fragment of papyrus, no concert in, the, in Berlin. And this is a small portion of the text, as you can see. For my talk, I shall be quoting the Greek text of Nonos and the English translation of the Loeb edition, making some changes when necessary. An academic interest for Nonos in general and for the Genesiaca in particular, developed recently 
especially in the past decade. One, they quote here, the Brill's Companion, edited by Domenico Accolenti in 2016, but also the proceedings of the Nomos and Context Conferences, which take place every two, three years since 2011. The last one just happened last May in Madrid, Spain. Here I also uh, indicated uh, a map um, showing where we are, Italy to the left, we are today in Venice, and all the way up to India to the right. So uh, many thanks to our Indian colleagues who have made all this long journey to be with us today. And I'm especially grateful to be able to share and exchange views with Professor Anupa Goswami, who presented this morning. As you shall see, our two papers have several points of contact. Today, I will focus only on six verses of this very long poem. Here we are at the beginning of book 37, that is to say the last quarter of the poem. At the end of book 36, the two armies, the Greeks on one side, the Indians on the other, had decided to conclude a truce in order to proceed to the funerals of their deaths. So as you see already on both sides, a very, let's phrase it that way, humanistic side uh, and uh, concerns about the respect due to the dead. You see the parallelism between uh, oil men, the Indians in one side, and uh, verse 6, the army of Bacchus on the other. Verse 1, what is most interesting here, and from us in boy, the Indians are characterized with a very specific adjective, and from. And from is best translated by wise. And here, don't look at the translation of rules, which is particularly um, not correct. Let's phrase it that way. And from comes from uh, the Neoplatonic vocabulary. So it is striking that the characterization of the Indians is not made as if they were enemies, but instead in, uh, by, by the mean of the uh, Greek term. Moreover, and this is another change which needs to be made in the translation here, philotheti menelotes, they are concerned with philotes, which is roughly human feelings, uh, humanity, which could be also translated basically by love, their care for the other humans. So the humanities of the so-called enemies. There's two, you have uh, the, context, uh, the context of the narrative. Uh, in the epic, as I told you already, we have the truth. So the Indians threw their back equal to the winds. They stop fighting. And verse three, the interesting uh, problem starts. The verb, et plus santo really means to bury, and they are burying their dead. So we find ourselves somehow in a paradoxical situation. Here in that passage, we have the Indians characterized with burial as a funeral practice, when on the other hand, the, the rest of the book, which is quite long, refers to Ophelthes, the companion of Dionysus, funerals, and for Ophelthes, we attend the preparation of a lavish construction so that the warrior would be burned. So cremation, but burial is on the side of the Indians and cremation is on the side of the Greeks. Oh, sorry, yeah, I said right. Burial Indians, cremation for the Greeks. This does not reflect contemporary Greek practices. The most obvious explanation will be a literary one. The obvious poetic model for this entire book 37 is book 23 of the Iliad with the funerals of Patroclus. 
So here, I would say that the literary model is prevalent over historical realia. Then we attend funerary games, etc. But going back to the first half of the verse, and by the way, here you can admire the way of composing poetry of Nonos, verse two and three. Those are two perfect examiners with a tetra column, so only four long words per verse. And this is the ideal um, of the Kalimachian poetry. So the first um, expression of verse three, Omasim Aklotosim, the Indians bury the dead with tearless eyes. They don't cry. And here, I show you another passage, a few lines later in the same book, where this is about Bacchus on the opposite side, who is also mourning his death. And the same expression is being used, omasin aklotoisin, with tearless eyes. Except here, Dionysus is characterized as following a Greek ritual of cutting some hair and to lay it on the tomb of the deceased to show uh, respect. And please note also the abundance of um, privative alpha, which denotes the definition by the, neg the negation. And that also is important, not only in poetry, but for the theological point that we are about to make. I'm going back to the main passage. Verse four, It is a question of the humans being as prisoners now set free from the earthly chains of human life. The earth chains being the Gaia Rufma and Fugontas, the verb is very strong. They are escaping from uh, this uh, from this uh, status. So this philosophical attitude we had seen in the apparent no manifestation of mourning on both sides, the Indian and the Greek, is explained by uh, the, the following uh, verses. Um, I wanted to see something also very briefly of the possible allusion here to the Platonic uh, myths of uh, the cave in Plato's Republic, where Death is an escape from the prison of life. And here, this image of the humans as prisoner of their own body, with death coming as a liberation from earthly link and the weight of the flesh, refers to the balance of the couple between peiras, which is the limitation, and apeiron, the unlimited, the infinite. And finally, we come to the key. Which is which are verses five and six. The soul returning whence it came back to the starting place in the circling course. In that one verse and a half only, we have a very dense, very meaningful theological content. Now, freed from the body, the soul goes back to its origins. Here we have three elements. First, the expression sukes tempomenes. This is motion. What characterizes the soul is motion. What is not said explicitly, but it is suggested, is that the soul flies away from earth through the sky in the direction of heaven, or at least uh, not a geographical located heaven, but another place. Uh, an ayer, which is, and this is the second element of interest, then it goes back to the origin. And the third element is this beautiful expression, with class, circle, and seire, the chain. So this motion is not linear, but circular. Here again, we have the geometrical figure of the infinite. 
This belongs to the philosophical neoplatonical vocabulary. But here, we must never forget, Nonos is not a theologian, he's a poet. So this is developed in a literary poetic way with a metaphor of the race of horses. And this is verse six, Mishkan Eis Akayen, the soul is going back to the beginning of the race with Musa being the turning post. And this is a Greek Byzantine contemporary reality, the one of the Hippodrome. So you see Nonos as a poet addresses theological concepts with very uh, understandable and day-to-day uh, and, uh, -day, uh, reality life allusions. So on one hand, we have an allusion to an Indian theological theory, which is metempsychosis. But on the other hand, Nonos expresses it through three filters the poetical expressions, the Neoplatonic doctrine, and the contemporary reality of the first Byzantine period. And, and I'll put it the time, don't worry. In order to go a bit further with the theological uh, aspect, Here you have uh, a passage from the Phaedrus of Plato, which is uh, basically uh, the concept of immortality based on motion. What moves is immortal. And those are uh, the famous uh, expression, psyche pasta athanatos. So every soul is immortal. Togar aikineton asanaton, for that which is ever moving is immortal. Then Plato gives the whole demonstration of it. And the other uh, key expression a bit later, asanatu de pefasmenu tu ufeo tukinumenu, suke sousia, tekai logon to pronoton, etc. So this self-motion is the essence and the very idea of the soul. And then the final uh, conclusion, ex ananges argenetor again the privative alpha, tekai asenaton psyken an eye, then the soul would necessarily be ungenerated and immortal. So we've seen that immortality is based on motion. And this motion is circular. And this is a passage from Proclus. So you see, we have Plato, the founder of the Platonic school, and now we are at the other end of the Platonic school, which is the great uh, Athenian philosopher Proclus, the, the last uh, great figure of the Platonic Academy. And in the Elements of Theology, Proposition 146, he says, in any divine procession, the end is assimilated to the beginning. So that's exactly what we have here. Maintaining by its reversion, theta, a circle without beginning and without ends. And here, apart from my beloved privative alpha, but that's understood, uh, the key word is epistrophe. Epistrophe is this idea of reversion, this idea of circularity that you find expressed four times in that uh, short passage. So for the sake of time, I'm going to my conclusions, because I have two conclusions. My first element of conclusion, I will use in a surprising way, a juridic evidence. We've seen that Nonos touches on the concept of metapsychosis, but it doesn't go as far as metensarcosis, the theory of reincarnation in itself. So it's all acceptable for Nonos to talk about the soul leaving the body. It's another story to say that the soul goes back in another body and it doesn't do that. It stops halfway. And obviously the question is, um, why? Why does it go to the point of reincarnation? It's because it's a delicate matter for a Christian, Orthodox, 
and um, this is uh, part of the Ecumenical Council of Constantinople II in 553 AD that uh, we have under Justinian, Emperor Justinian, the condemnation of the Orishistic theories on reincarnation. So a very delicate matter in Byzantium, and Nonos doesn't want to touch upon that. And my real conclusion will be an iconographical, uh, not an evidence, but something to reflect on. This is a great cosmological mosaic of Shabbat Filipopolis in Syria, dated uh, mid third century. And what you have here, uh, apart from the cosmological composition with a central figure of Earth uh, on the first uh, on the ground, uh, on the left you have Ion, which is time, but this is the circularity of time. This is eternity expressed by the same symbol of the wheel which sometimes not here on that particular mosaic, but most of the time also wear the zodiacal symbols. And on the right, and this is our point, you have the Greek representation of the creation of man. Prometheus is depicted uh, sitting as an uh, artisan and with some mud is actually modeling a little figure which is a protoplasmos, the first man. And right above, you have the god Hermes associated to the souls, who is driving this little girl with uh, butterfly wings, and she is a personification of the soul. And the soul is about to be joined to the um, Man, the body made of mud, and if you look carefully, the mosaics really um, rendered very well the expression of terror and horror of the soul falling into uh, a sleep body. And um, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Well, well, after this very interesting also uh, presentation of uh, Dr. Dorfin Lauritsen, we can, a very important theme, really important theme, uh, we can uh, talk about and about. We came to Professor uh, Sigma Vadar, Yadav, sorry, School of Heritage Research Management of at the University of New Delhi, India, with him. An outlook on the trade and economy of India and Greece during the Hellenistic period again. Thank you very much. We have plenty of things. Good afternoon, my dear friends, colleagues. So, first, I would like to thank Hellenic Institute of Byzantine and Post Byzantine Studies for inviting me to present my paper, or not paper, but my ideas and thought on Indo-Hellenistic heritage. I would like to thank Professor U.P. Aroda with my sincere gratitude to him under whose dynamic life, leadership and guidance all of us are here and he has a main contribution for the revival of Indo-Greek studies in India for last 50 years. Another thanks is to Professor Anil Kumar and J from JNU for his sincere efforts and very devoted time for organizing and collaborating this conference and bringing all of us together on this platform. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you now. So my paper is on the trade, culture and tourism and the legacy, what we received from the past, what we are pursuing at present or what we can preserve or gift for the future. So my paper is divided into three categories. So please give me some patience hearing to understand my ideas and this thing. So learning from history is a continuous process and dialogue. So no period in historical context is understood without its background in the past and in the, its relevance in contemporary society. 
Hellenistic age is a complex interplay of culture, language, economies, and politics that often occur in human action in the past centuries. With the Hellenistic age, we borrowed the beginning of the first intercontinental cooperation and collaboration. It connects and unifies the culture and economies of three continents, that is Europe, Asia, and Africa for perpetuity. So since Alexander's campaign, the Hellenistic period had been subject of much investigation, research, survey, and academic debates worldwide in the past and present. Our focus on the Hellenistic world from India to Greece via Venice is a convenient laboratory to understand how the Hellenistic legacy was adopted in a period which witnessed two major series of political transformation in the shape of Hellenistic monarchies and rise of Roman Empire in the West and rise of empires from modern empire to the present uh, in India and China in the East. The Hellenistic institutions enabled the communities on a scale of time and space to engage in and exploit as best possible the cultural, economic, and political context of the period and beyond, and how these communities evolve among themselves and precisely how they develop sustainable mechanism dependent considerably on the scale and regional context in which they existed. The availability of much evidence on tangible and intangible heritage offers enhanced insight into various aspects of life with degree of change and continuity. In the present context, I will devote my thesis or my ideas or from present to past, not from past to present, but from present to past, that is the beginning of new relationship that is 2,500 years old. The arrival of the Alexander Great in the Indian subcontinent in 330 to 323 BC and present in 2023, our Prime Minister visited Greece last month on 25th August 9, 2023. So these centuries of continuous dialogue were preserved in antiquity in many classical literature, literature literary work, archaeological work. So I'm not going to repeat the text in the present context because our colleagues are giving the list of the literary sources. So in the last centuries, the campaign of Alexander was promoted and projected as a tool of political supremacy and hegemony of the West over the East to legitimize colonialism and imperialism. But in the present century, the coming of Greeks in India and their interaction with Indian culture should be celebrated to mark the cultural assimilations and amalgamation of Indo-Hellenistic age or heritage on bilateral terms and multilateral terms. So India and Greece relationship in the present context started from 1950s when the diplomatic mission was established and it is continuing and in the last 9th September, a new treaty or MOU was signed for in which the India should be the, Greece should be the gateway of East for India, which we should work on that. So another aspect we, we should consider here is that from the continuous legacy from Alexander the Great to Marco Polo and how they preserve the, this legacy or this continuity in their respective world, that is ancient world and the medieval world. And now we are continuing that in the present context. So Western world connect Asia and India from Alexander Great to Marco Polo. The two great personalities lived apart for a gap of 1600 years. The first was a political leader and diplomat, and the second was a merchant and cultural ambassador. Still, both were adventurers interested in exploring the Asian world of the ancient and medieval world. These are the period because when Marco Polo traveled in 13th century, at the length and breadth of Silk Road, he was most famously associated with Indo-Hellenistic world, and he revived that in order he give us that insight of the Indo-Hellenistic world in his memoir, which was Book of the Marvels of the World, which is translated in various languages and published for the understanding of the medieval period. So his roots provide as a good outline as any for defining the geopolitics of Eurasia in the coming eras, and many travelers adopted his strategies after him. 
and many writers adopted his memoirs for the writing of the uh, their insight over the Indo-Hellenistic legacies. So he has traveled all along from Venice to China and and route to India. So he spent considerable considerable time in the Indo-Hellenistic treaties or areas, territories where he gave the first hand informations. So in pagan context, another legacy, which is the making of Indo-Hellenistic world and geopolitics of Indo-Hellenistic world in the present context. So the word Hellenistic was first used in the reign of Dolby Flarel was by Hellenized Jews to define the Greek language and culture. In the middle of the 19th century, German scholar John Gustav Drossen started the widespread use of the word Hellenism to designate the period in ancient history that stretches from the beginning of Alexander's reign, 336 BC, to Battle of Actum, 31 BC, which established Octavian Augustus as emperor of the Roman Empire. But in the Indian subcontinent, the Indo-Hellenistic culture and economy survived through the upheavals of the Western Empire. And as a heritage student, we face very difficulty in the understanding of these past centuries because of the lack, not the lack of the information, but because we did not have the concrete or synthetic ready-made survey. So we have to work hard to explore that heritage. So in Indian sources, the manifestation of Hellenism started appearing much later and varied in nature in contrast to Egyptian, Persian, Roman, and Byzantine sources. So we owe the debt to Byzantine period for preserving such documents for perpetuity and revival of knowledge. Because Byzantine Empire or emperors borrowed the calligraphers or copists of manuscripts to implicate or to interpret or to write these manuscripts and sources. So Byzantine we owe that it preserve and disseminate Hellenistic knowledge geographically, chronologically, especially to the world. So geopolitics of the Indo-Hellenistic period is because empire building, political integration and disintegration have been part of the state formation and empire building process was continuing in this region since Alexander's conquest over the region and establishment of the Mauryan Empire in East and Roman Empire in the West. But Hellenistic rulers and people were early practitioner of globalization. So this age can be called as the first age of globalization, seeking to connect the whole of habitable Eurasia in a genuinely multicultural empire, where the polity and economy of empires like Mauryan, Seleucids, Ptolemies are examples that is still defined and borrowed by the modern states. Never before in history did Western civilization reach such a point of geopolitical conclusion and raw power as during the Hellenistic age and its immediate aftermath. However, despite the empire conflicts, warfare, and the rise and decline, the most compelling weapons were not swords, but the trade and exchange of items like gems, fabrics, textile, metals, and so on among the Indo-Hellenistic empires. The development of trade routes and commerce, not the projection of military power and warfare, were the grand strategies adopted by Indian Indo-Hellenistic rulers to gain prosperity in these landlocked regions and regions and which is very diverse and challenging in terms of geographical area. So this is the ancient map of the Indo-Hellenistic kingdoms and this is the present geography of the Central Asia, Western India, Pakistan and Afghanistan. We show how we borrowed or we owe the legacy of Indo-Hellenistic kingdom and during this time of conflict we have to look in the past to solve the present problems with multiculturalism and with a thoughtfulness for the assimilation of culture. So there were several significant impacts from this extensive network of interaction, the development of cities along this route, which gained power and wealth, power and wealth, and the development of religious centers benefited from patronage of political system and wealthy individuals, the movement of technology, artistic style, language, social practice, and religious and spiritual beliefs transmitted by people moving along on this Indo-Hellenistic route. Though generally it is called Silk Route, but I prefer to call it as an Indo-Hellenistic route. So today the reality of this historical Indo-Hellenistic or Silk Route is re-emerging in a new geopolitical context of India, 
Central Asia, West Asia, and the surrounding regions with the potential for shared prosperity among the states connected within this rule. So breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991 dramatically transformed the political and economic landscape of modern Silk Road. And now modern countries want to be part of this Indo-Hellenistic uh, projects or legacy for the revival of their heritage. Another important issue is revisiting of sources and piece of evidence of Indo-Hellenistic period. Though there is no shortage of sources to study the Hellenistic period during this, because during the Alexander's period, he accompanied by historians and geographers who recorded the events, places, and people as eyewitness account. So these sources contain information about cities, toponyms, routes, and in the past, and much research has been focused on identifying these features. But the authenticity and dating of Western classical sources are reasonably well established. But the identification or an authenticity of the Indian sources is always a matter of debate where no consensus has been seen or arrived among the scholars here, which are defining our Indo-Hellenistic connections. The archaeological sources like exploration and excavation of sites, coins, inscription, spread over different a very large geographical terrain, which were earlier under colonization and usually divided between the archaeologists of Britain, France, Germany, and other countries. So archaeological, artistic, epigraphical, numismatic material from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Central Asia, and India, which reveals a prosperous, diverse culture is not in our study, so, which is not open for the study all the time to the young scholars. So much of the historical material from region is illegally excavated and only appears on black markets. We have little or no historical context for much of that ancient evidences which are coming from this region. And this is a matter of concern because this means that new findings are often studied or existed in a historical vacuum. Another important aspect, so there are various sources, there's epigraphical sources, Greek, Aramaic, Haroste, Brahmic, uniform, Egyptian, papyrus, etc., which should be compiled together to understand the Hellenistic period. The important point on which we can devote our time in future or in present for the understanding of trade and economy of Indo-Hellenistic period is the Indo-Hellenistic cities of West are well studied and documented because of the available sources, but Indo-Hellenic studies, cities of India, right from Takshila, which was the first excavated city, and the latest one is Al Khanum in Afghanistan, which was excavated in 1970s. There is a long list of studies like Takshila, Bactria, Sogdania, Alexandria in the, this region, Sialkot, Bamiyan, Mathura, Kapisa, Arakoshia, Gandha, Nisa, Patal, Alphanu, Kamer Tape, Seleucusia, Ontigris, Urk, Bishtu, Susha, Persepolis, Antioch. These cities are there, but we have nothing in the form of heritage of these cities or documentation of these cities in the present context. So these Indo-Hellenistic settlements emerge in a territory enjoying a degree of autonomy or semi-responsible government without serving or breaking ties with the parent state of Greece or India and without attaining the more accessible status of dominion, the community living in these cities were united by common characteristic of the interest living in limited sections surrounded by others. The, these new developments profoundly changed the agriculture and cultivation practices and technology. Development and knowledge of new crops and manufacturing activities for local and global markets and conjunctions, besides many other branches of economic life in the region, flourishing during this Hellenistic period. The quantity growth of new urban centers and their data is important for the understanding of the past. Another is international monetary system and financial system, which was developed by Indo-Greek or Indo-Bactrian rulers in India is important because more international monetary system was first founded in during this period. And on this line, we are still continuing Hellenistic period currencies like Dashma, Dinar, and Indian currencies like Panchma coins, Indian gold standard of Satma were there for it established the foundation for the international monetary system and financial system, which we are still pursuing. Another important point is the understanding of monsoon ecosystem, trade, and economy. 
from periplus to present time the codification of the monsoon system its impact on economy agriculture of the region of east and west was codified from this hellenistic period to present time and during this time of climate change we have to rely on the past knowledge for the transmission and understanding of the climate change and the development of roads cities agriculture production manufacturing etc so the indo greek contribution of the indo greek rulers in the starting of a new system of money with the script and portraits of king and depiction of deities changed the course of indian monetary system and one of the largest finding of the greek coins in a village known as mirjak in afghanistan is very important where we found around more than 5 lakh coins which made their way to various markets of world in illegally directly or indirectly so the study of all these material is important for us trading commodities are always a subject of change and varies from period to period but major commodities were spices textile silk wood metal etc now second part is cities on indo hellenistic routes map is showing the density of the indo hellenistic hellenistic trade routes which emerged from 3rd century bc and most of the cities are still in survival mode or living cities so study or excavation of these living heritage is one of the important part hellenistic trade routes i have already explained though it is called silk route because of the description given by german scholar in 1870 but basically it is the hellenistic trade routes which define the notion on the indo hellenistic culture point of view we are the two ancient civilization in a continuous dialogue so during this period main contribution is on the language that is greek and sanskrit become the lingua franca and my colleague has established the contribution of the sir william jones on the comparative study of greek and the sanskrit language exchange of ideas and continuous cultural dialogue among scholars and artists through the ages promotion of inter community exchange and marriages by alexander himself and which is still continuing and the villages in himachal pradesh kashmir ladakh traces their ancestry with greeks for now the last point of my presentation the future opportunities for the preservation and promotion of indo hellenistic heritage and culture that is how we receive the ancient heritage and how we preserve it because archaeology started simultaneously in greece with henry mars efforts and alexander cunningham efforts in study of indology was started with this efforts of sir william jones and now the i propose or i would like to work on the following things that we have to from this uh, opportunity indo hellenistic heritage tourism circuits establishment of indo hellenistic museums in india and greece indo hellenistic heritage interpretation centers mapping of ethnic communities in the region of indian subcontinent and central asia and the last period the projects covering the heritage of indo hellenistic world are the unesco project on silk road project mosam from india project one belt one road from china are important for the preservation of and promotion of indo hellenistic heritage and culture and in the last g20 nations declaration on culture at rome in 2021 and varanasi in the last week 2023 are important for the understanding of indo hellenistic culture because culture unites all and we organize this g20 celebration with the motto one earth one family one future that is the principle of vasudev kutumbakam from rigved to the present period we are giving to the world and important documents are the kashi culture pathway also known as the varanasi declaration on culture on 26 august 2003 is another milestone in connecting people through culture because this uh, kashi culture pathways is important g20 summit was started with the economic uh, connection between these nations but now the importance of culture was realized by these nation and they formed this culture declaration the first draft was formed in rome in 21 and this was with consensus 100% consensus this document was signed in varanasi on 26 august 2003 and in on 9 september we have signed a mou with the as india greece connectivity
first degree. We are arriving to the, our last uh, presentation. Before, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Gada uh, for this, this very interesting uh, presentation. Of course, the last uh, future uh, proposal that's good for a thought and for money. It's a lot of very interesting uh, proposal, but we need money for uh, people who can help us to, to make all these interesting proposals. I really, very interesting. okay, we can talk about. And uh, the last, uh, our last uh, presentation, Professor Manisa Tiagi from Swami Vivekana, the Kutarpi University uh, School of Buddhist Studies in New York, in India, with a theme created cross cultural content, a Greco Roman girl, with special reference to South India, a trap of Ben Sirlaga. Please. Mm. Okay, you have 20 minutes, please. Please give it a try. Very important. I know. Yeah, but I think the point is how to this person. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, there is a little correction in my topic. This is many times paid context of Greco Roman word with special reference to South India and Taprobani, means Sri Lanka. It's, a, it's like a triangle uh, of trade, ancient trade context between Greco Roman word through South India and then to Sri Lanka. So, because I have already given the restriction of time, so I will skip a few portions of it. Uh, the history of South India is uh, noted with the history of border and Sri Lanka and the surrounding regions also. The proximity of Sri Lanka to the subcontinent of India and the island's strategic position uh, to the south of it gave it, uh, gave it Sri Lanka an important place in the oceanic commerce of the mainland of India from very early time and set her a commanding position on the silk route of the sea. Uh, the island was known to the Indians of the Indus Valley as well as uh, as early as the 4th century BC and to the Greeks and Romans, Taprovani was known with the age and achievement of Alexander's expedition in northwestern India. In the Hellen Hellenistic world, Sri Lanka was famous by various names, but the most popular name was Taprovani. This name was subsequently adopted by all legend authors as well, and it is generally agreed that the name Taprovani was derived from the Sanskrit Tamrapani, uh, copper cost Pali Tamrapani. The ancient Sri Lankan Buddhist records of Mahavansh, uh, Deepavansh, and the rock edict number 13 of Ashoka have reference to the island of Sri Lanka. According to Mahavansh and Deepavansh, Greeks were the first European who came to Sri Lanka, and the Mahavansh they were mentioned as Yonas. This is the particular word given uh, by the uh, Sri Lankans uh, to the Greek Romans. The first, uh, that, uh, the first Latin author to mention Sri Lanka was the poet Ovid and Cosmos Indicoplastus. Uh, he said it that the great resort of ships from all parts of India, Persia, and Ethiopia and Telita Mediatrix between the east and west. So, uh, According to our sources, Greek Roman came to know about Lanka by the time of Alexander. Greek captain of great Alexander's navy called Onesicritus, who was the first Greek who wrote about Sri Lanka. And he certainly had access to information from the Indians who were in contact with the navigators sailing to Sri Lanka. Surely Europeans got to know about this country from that. His fragments on Taprabani were preserved by Strabo, Pliny. Alexander planned the coastal voice from the mouth of Indus to the head of the Persian Gulf, which was executed by Nearchus. Nearchus recorded that Alexander built a fleet of ships during his eastern exploration so as to proceed southward to explore Taprobani. However, on his writers sail down to the mouth of the Indus, it appeared that he noticed some vessels were used to sail on the route from Sindh to Sri Lanka, and he informed that the island had 20 days sail from the mainland, Indian mainland. That mariners from Sri Lanka continued to make voyages to the western part of India, evident from the early Brahmi inscriptions from Mavikatana in the 
Kurun Gela district, in which a mariner by the name of Maha Ashok, who described himself as having gone to Boj Katar. So, according to a very famous historian, uh, Guna Bardhani, he appropriately correlated this evidence with the report of Onisic writers, who pointed out that Onisic writers had apparently noticed a certain sailing vessel use on the route from Sindh to Sri Lanka. Uh, here I have used some uh, literary evidences, but due to the restriction of time, I am skipping uh, most of them. But uh, I, over, I can say that over 40 classical Greek and Roman authors uh, who mentioned about Sri Lanka and India and Sri Lanka relation, uh, sorry, uh, about this reason. Uh, both Odyssey writers and Megas Neal had first an experience of India because they spent their time, they spent their time in India. Most of the reasons they described concerning Taprobani's location, uh, I am skipping this portion. On his writer say that it is 20 days voice distance from the mainland of India, but the ship sailed badly since their sailing gear is inefficient and they are built without belly bolts on both sides. And he also mentioned the amphibious creatures exist around him. On his writers himself could have obtained this information while he was in northwestern India, we know that he was sent to Takshila by Alexander. In order to discuss with the Indian wise men, apart from being a well-known center of learning. Takshila was also a prosperous trading city of international renown. So too was the Indus Delta, whence Onisicritus and the Greeks set sail for Persia. Either of these places could have supplied him with information about Taprobani, but even though he didn't reach the island, he shared with other Greek early Greek writers a privilege enjoyed by few of their successors, namely that of being able to gather knowledge about Taprobani in reasons closely associated with it. Megas Neal, the another uh, informer for us, he an ambassador to the modern um, uh, and Emperor Chandragupta Skogur, he was another famous Greek writer. His fragments of Taprobani are preserved by Pliny. And he uh, wrote that India and Sri Lanka are divided by river and the inhabitants are Pelogone and they are more productive of gold, large pearls and like the Indians. He was the first Hellenistic writer who mentioned Sri Lankan pearls um, and some other uh, trade commodities also. The evidence given by Megasthenes, Pliny and Periclus are proved by some other Asian literatures also. The Mahabharata narrates how the king of the Sundar sent to King Yudhishthira the best of free born gems and other uh, pearls. White pearls are among them, and some other information here also provide us, but I'm uh, going, uh, I'm skipping these. The most comprehensive and scientific foreign account of Sri Lanka uh, is the geography of Ptolemy, Claudius Ptolemy. He also presented a map of Sri Lanka. And uh, he uh, gave uh, his uh, knowledge uh, in chapter 11.4 uh, in his book, Geographia. And in his in it he said that Sri Lanka is largely exaggerated in size. But uh, in spite of such errors, the treatise of Ptolemy on the whole was the most accurate of ancient geographical works. And it has been the most comprehensive and standard document evidence until the modern time. Among his fauna are elephants and tigers, and he mentioned feeding groups of the elephants also. And Ptolemy is the first to name some of the food products of Taprobani, like fruits, grain, rice, honey, ginger, etc. Another important writer about Sri Lanka was Cosmos Indicoplastus, Indian navigator, and his work is also very important. And he provides uh, some important information about the uh, boat construction and some other um, important uh, gems and stones. He said that Taprobani is a large island in the Indian Ocean where the precious stones hyacinth is found and is situated above the Kappa country. Cosmos mentions elephants used in war were bred chiefly in Sri Lanka and the information is uh, confirmed through the Hathi Gumpa inscription of Kave also. So now uh, I'm discussing few archaeological evidences also. And uh, I will use uh, it like as a second info source of information. And uh, some important archaeological discoveries made during last 20 to 30 years in Sri Lanka, where uh, it, it is very noticeable. In Greco Roman trade connections, some sites are very uh, important. They are Anuradhapur, Sigiriya, and uh, Kantarudai, 
this uh, Mahrama, it is very important. Uh, uh, so many findings of Victor Roman points also there. And the great discovery of the use of the monsoon winds, winds to sail from the mount to the Red Sea direct across the Indian Ocean was made by a Greek named Hippolos in the first century BC. Periplus implies that Hippolos discovered the use of the southwest monsoon for voyages direct from African and Arabian regions to the Indus, Berigaja, and the Malabar coast, and that all these voyages were suggested and made by him about the same time. Before 1st century AD, Greco Roman traders bought the commodities from South India. Uh, but during the later part of the 1st century AD, increasing demands for Eastern luxuries forced the Romans to explore fresh supplies and new markets, and this caused the discovery of Sri Lanka. This information by Pericles is very significant in the context of Greco Roman and Sri Lankan commercial relations. Besides, his two more uh, incidents also brought the Sri Lanka close that with Greco Roman country. First, Diodorus tells when Iombelus in the spice trees of the Somali coast was accidentally taken by winds to an island supposed to have been Sri Lanka. The story is full of fable, but one fact comes out that the man was drifted by monsoon winds to Indian regions. Again, a curious incident that this is really important. In the first century of the Christian era, brought Sri Lanka to near touch with Rome. The discovery of Taprobani by a freedman of Aeneas Plopamus therefore represents a fundamental moment in the history of relation between Rome and Taprobani. The work of Elder Pini contains one of the longest ancient account of this episode. So far, the facts states have been recorded by the early writers. We, however, have obtained more accurate information during the Principate of Claudius when an embassy actually came to Rome from the island of Taprobani. The circumstances were as follows. Alien Procamus had procured a contract from the treasury to collect the taxes of the Red Sea. A freedman of his while sailing round Arabia, he was carried by wind storm from the north beyond the coast of Carmini. And after a fortnight late, the harbor of Hipporos in Taprobani, where he was entertained and shown kind hospitality by the king, and in a period of six months acquired a through thorough knowledge of the language. Subsequently, in reply to the king's inquiries, he gave him an account of the Roman and their emperor of all that he heard. The king was remarkably struck by Roman equity because among the money found on the captive, the denarius were all equivalent in size and weight. And although the various images on them showed that they had been coined by several emperors, this most of all persuaded him to extend his friendship and he sent for envoys, the chief of whom was Gratia, who was sent by the singlest king to establish a direct commercial contact with Claudius. This episode proved historical even because from this incident, the European came to know about Sri Lanka. Later on, discoveries, uh, direct entrance from Rome to Sri Lanka had become open, but this men also didn't know the use of monsoon winds. Uh, one more relation I want to uh, discuss here was captured by Mahavansha. I, I, I know this. <laughs> the great, that's uh, like very fast. <laughs> The great chronicle of Sri Lanka, Mahavansh mentioned Buddhists from Greek territories of Peru Pemisadai among the foreign delegation who were invited by the singlish state, Dhatu, uh, sorry, Dutta Gamani, a close contemporary of Indo Greek King Melanger. For the inauguration of the great Stoop, Ruben Delhi Devaba and Radhapur, and it is mentioned in Mahavansh and from Alasandha, the city of Yonas, Yona. Yona Nagara Alessandra came the third Yona Dham Rakshita with 30,000 big shoes. The name of the Buddhist monk and the number of the delegation of this, of course, a uh, little unusual and exaggerated, but one cannot ignore the fact that uh, there was a certain knowledge about important Buddhist communities in the Greek territories uh, at that time. Uh, as we know from the time of Roman Emperor Augustus till the death of Nero in AD 68, there was a great demand of spices, muslins, pearls, and precious stones in the Roman Empire, and the Greeks sent these articles to Rome through South India, South Indian ports. After the death of Nero, the trade decreased, but in, uh, in slow process, trade continued till the early part of the third century. 
The products of Sri Lanka too were taken to South India to be sold, and the Greco Roman trader took the articles from the Indian shores. But this trade with India ceased in the second century AD when the Greeks came directly to Sri Lanka for the products of this island. From the second century AD till the earlier part of the third century, Greek traders came to the island. By the fourth century, the Abzimites had monopolized the Indian seaborne trade and they used them as middlemen. There was again started a revival of trade between Rome and the East countries after the time of Constantine, who made Byzantine the capital of Roman Emperor Empire and brought it into close contact with the East. These searches resulted in Mariner's regular visit to the port of Sri Lanka. Wilmington also confirmed that although it was not frequent, some merchants had begun to trade directly with Sri Lanka itself. He also mentioned that sailing beyond the Cape were not very regular, and it is possible that even in his time and afterward, the bulk of the product of Sri Lanka reached the Greeks by way of Tamil and especially Malabar regions in, uh, through Indian vessels, which deprived Greeks to trade directly with Sri Lanka. Now it's the question why Romans who dared to endure the perils of a long voyage to South India did not enter into direct trade relation with Sri Lanka. The opinion that the South Indian invasion of the island were undertaken with the intention of controlling the ports of Sri Lanka, this is one opinion, and in order to prevent the Sri Lanka's trade with Romans. One thing is also important to mention here that probably Indian merchants discouraged such trade contacts, direct trade contacts, Several Greek writers refer to stories regarding the hazardous sea around Sri Lanka and dangerous features in the Jews that eat up human beings. Uh, the tales about the Yakshas, Rakshasas living in the island were propagated by monopolistic Indian merchants to discourage others likely to compete with them around to Sri Lankan sea. Might be the early created fears like such as stories about the monsters like animals and sea beasts, sea beasts about Sri Lanka uh, to come to direct on shores of Sri Lanka, wiped out the merchant and would have been quite comfortable to come here in future. Perhaps the sea distance between South India and Sri Lanka was not too much. And uh, surely they wanted to reduce the extra charges which they had to pay to the South Indian middleman. So the Romans who were the great sailor of that time uh, choose the direct route to Sri Lanka now and however, uh, the very famous historian Dr. Dr. Veera Kodi correctly pointed out that it was like a rediscovery of Sri Lanka uh, uh, that time as a trade power uh, for, for further centuries. There is certain truth when Strabo tells us that from Taprobani, ivory, tortoise shell, and other merchandise were brought in abundance to the markets of Indians. It is also really strange that Greek Romans, who were frequent traders and visitors to Sri Lanka, rarely mention name of its ports. But uh, Aeneas Procamus during his sail reached, accidentally reached the ports of Hipporos. Now it is uh, known as Kadramalai or sail in the island. Periplus mentions some Sri Lankan ports with chain name. These are Koduke, Kamira, and Sopatama. But I'm not dis uh, discussing more about them. But I can say that the many Roman uh, uh, findings, uh, like uh, built, uh, sites of Roman buildings, the residents of Roman merchants, in addition to Roman coins and articles of trade, have been found here. And uh, some other uh, fragments of like beads, various kinds of fragments of necklaces of different shapes and sizes are also found there. One important quote I would like to discuss here about Mahatitha or Matutha because it is very important in the context of Greek Roman trade with Sri Lanka and uh, the chief port you can say. And uh, the, uh, usually the Greek Roman traders and other traders exchange their commodities on this, this because so many findings we can found, Greek Roman findings are found through this course. And uh, through uh, the another port in this context is Gotavia is very important in the same context. But I would like to take only two minutes of you because some three robbers I, I would like to work on also. So Roman Empire was in great demand as I already told you spices, muslin and some other articles from South India. So it's shown by the fact that the Greeks words for pepper, ginger and cinnamon are derived from Tamil words. Besides its few birds from Sri Lanka were also a part of export items. These birds were exported from India, Burma and Andaman also. The evidence from the ancient classical writers described the spices of birds. The ring neck parakeet uh, was most frequent and engraved upon classical gemstones is found in India, Sri Lanka and Burma. 
Tatius described the beautiful bosom headed parakeet also, native to many parts of India and Sri Lanka. Romans were in high demand of tortoise shell of the Aprovani. Roman obtained top, top, uh, tortoise shell came from several turtles belonging to coast of Indian Sea. It appears that they knew the tortoise shell of Taprovani as early as the commencement of monsoon navigated for trade with India. Though Periplus says that the best of all tortoise shell came from the Malaya Peninsula. Pepper and cinnamon was another trade object from Sri Lanka. As early as the imperial era, pepper was used as a spice in every respectable household in Rome. So it became an important article of Roman sea trade with India and Sri Lanka. The long pepper, which was exported from Delhi, Kaja, Bharat, and Mujeris, Kerala, used as medicine. This was obtained from the food spikes of pepper langium native to various parts of India, Malaya, and Sri Lanka. Pliny even provides a price list of it also. Long pepper is 15 denarius per pound, and uh, while white pepper is 7, and of black gold. He also called it black gold. So Ptolemy gives ginger as a fresh spice of information as a product of Sri Lanka. The next item for which Roman price for very much was cinnamon. The Roman prized it as a raw material and it was chiefly produced in China, Tiber, Sri Lanka and India. Sri Lankan cinnamon was now quite famous that the Romans knew nothing that the, from which part it came, but they tried to um, acquire it. So the reference of clothes reveals during the decline of Rome and early Byzantine Empire Cosmos shows that in the 6th century, this aromatic was well known to come from South India by the way of Sri Lanka to the marts of the west coast of India. So, I'm just reading some art, uh, archaeological evidences uh, also. Yes, one minute last. Okay, the, the last passage is there. This is uh, some archaeological evidence about the greco roman trade with Sri Lanka is connected to India. India found some evidences of Roman trade from Arika Beju. Excavation conducted in 1941-50 period of time is there. Archaeologists found wine jars, ceramic lamps, and ungenuine uh, cups and plates of terra, siglita, glass bowls, blue glazed fans, and some other findings we found uh, same from Arika Medu, and the same findings we can found uh, from the uh, Sri Lankan courts also. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> Because this is an archaeological paper, so I think I need to have more time. But thank you so much. Okay. Here is the end of the session. I'd like to thank you very much for the organization of this panel, of this congress. Very important part of my invitation. Okay, we will take. And uh, unfortunately, because of uh, the time, the study will come uh, uh, in the afternoon, in the session, in the beginning of the session, B. Uh, with Philippo, Rostrumpo, <laughs> and our colleagues also. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye. Oh. Thanks, <laughs> 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 Okay, sorry. We're not saying